Cinna Massacre's Monster Madness. Happy October. You know, killer mummies, why aren't they as popular as other types of monsters? Vampires, zombies, and aliens are always getting all this attention. So let's pay some respect to the mummies. For the rest of the week, I'm going to talk about the Universal Mummy series. I consider this to be the very first slasher series. This slasher villain doesn't use a sharp blade, instead his bare hands, but all the other traits are the same. It's a slow-moving killer with a body count whose face is covered and is immortal. At the end of each movie, they do something to kill him, but he always comes back. Everyone knows the cliché of the wrapped-up, mute, killer mummy who goes around strangling its victims, but the original 1932 film wasn't really like that at all. In fact, it wasn't even the same mummy. The mummy goes unwrapped, speaks, and has a more complex agenda. There never was an actual sequel to this movie. The rest of the Universal series focused on a different mummy, um, so why am I including it? Isn't this sequel-a-thon? Well, it's hard to separate them because they're all part of the classic Universal horror cycle, and even though it's not related story-wise, I can't skip over the original that started it all. After Universal made horror history with Dracula and Frankenstein, both in 1931, they immediately looked for another big hit. Inspired by the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb and the curse attached to it, they decided to make a movie about a mummy rising from the dead. And that's what Dracula was, a guy who lived after death and Frankenstein's monster was stitched together with dead body parts and brought back to life. So it's always about resurrection in some form or another. They're all zombies. What makes The Mummy unique is that unlike Dracula and Frankenstein, The Mummy was not based on a book. It was a fresh, original idea, even though there were some books like The Ring of Thoth, which bears a strong resemblance, uh, there was no direct literary source. In the opening scene, archaeologists discover the mummy of Imhotep. They read a warning that there's a curse. Death. Eternal punishment. For anyone who opens this casket. We know they're in deep shit, so we're waiting the whole time for the mummy to get up and kill them, and this makes for a genuinely suspenseful scene. When the mummy does get up, it's a very slow process. His eyes open slowly, the camera tilts down, the arms pull themselves free of the bandages. It's one of the best reveals to any monster in movie history. And then, the mummy doesn't do anything but take back his sacred scroll and leisurely walk away. It has to be said that this is the early 30s, so we were just coming off of the silent era of film. So a lot of these actors uh, weren't trained yet for sound film, uh, especially the supporting actors. They usually would overact and not do a convincing job, but this guy, Bramwell Fletcher, I buy it. I believe that he is really going insane. <laughs> This whole opening scene is so good. It manages to be creepy while being very minimal and subtle. You don't even see the mummy walk. Without the use of any music and very little on the soundtrack at all, it's one of the most effective scenes in the whole Universal catalog. Imhotep is of course played by Boris Karloff. For this one scene, the makeup on Karloff and wrapping of the bandages took eight hours. Then, after those eight hours, he still had to lay in the sarcophagus all night while they filmed the scene. I would bet that Boris Karloff is actually sleeping right there. The rest of the film, the mummy goes incognito, posing as a present-day Egyptian under the alias Ardeth Bey. The makeup is simple, maybe not in execution, but in concept. It's just wrinkles, again being very minimal. Karloff's face is so perfect to begin with. The makeup artist Jack Pierce was a genius and was single-handedly responsible for the iconic look of all these monsters, but he had such a great palette to work off of. Karloff commands this film. Every scene he's in, you feel like you're under his power. Look at how tall he is compared to everyone else. 
the wardrobe really complements his shape, especially with that fez. Look at how his neck arches forward. What an amazing profile. His hypnotic voice puts you in a trance. You will not remember what I show you now, and yet I shall awaken memories of love and crime and death. And that's another thing, he had such a great voice. After playing mute characters in previous Universal films like the monster in Frankenstein and the drunk butler Morgan in the old dark house, this time they finally let him show off his vocal charisma as well. The plot is very original. You might expect the mummy to be on some kind of revenge mission, but no, all he's doing is trying to be reunited with his mummy girlfriend, the princess Anxanamen. The only people he kills are those who get in his way. When they dig up the princess and put her in a museum, he tries to resurrect her, but it doesn't work. See, it's not her corpse he's after, it's her soul, and now her soul rests in the body of a young woman, the princess's modern-day reincarnation. How's that for a horror fairy tale? It's the story of a love that lasted thousands of years. Even though I said the plot was original, um, it is, but it also has many similarities with Dracula. Both movies begin with the Swan Lake music. Both have opening scenes that take place in the native land of the monster villain and then shift to a contemporary setting. A young woman is the monster's love interest, and in both movies, the monster wants to make her undead like himself. Her boyfriend is played by David Mannering in both movies, who is the third point in the love triangle. The hero in both movies is played by Edward Van Sloan. He's Van Helsing in Dracula and Dr. Muller in The Mummy. He's the guy who figures out that Dracula is the vampire and Ardeth Bay is the mummy. If I could get my hands on you, I'd break your dried flesh to pieces. And I will have Carfax Abbey torn down stone by stone, excavated a mile around. I will find your earth box and drive that stake through your heart. And in both movies, the monster's eyes get a lot of attention with a lot of creepy close-ups. Speaking of Bela Lugosi, he could have been the mummy. Yeah, if he would have taken the role of the monster in Frankenstein, uh, you know, the popular story is he turned the role down, other people say the director James Whale made the decision, but whatever the case, if Lugosi was the Frankenstein monster, it's very possible that he would have been cast as the mummy as well. It's very hard to imagine anyone other than Karloff in the role, but... Think about it. Think about bringing Lugosi's exotic and spellbinding presence into it. It would have been great in its own way. Even though this movie is similar to Dracula, you can tell how much more sophisticated it is with its subtle use of music and with its camera movements. Speaking of which, Carl Freund, the cinematographer on Dracula, is now in the director's chair. Basically, what I'm saying is that they learned a lot from their mistakes on Dracula, and this time shows a lot of technical advances. The Mummy is still a very quiet picture. It moves along at a leisurely pace, so if you're hoping for action and gore, this isn't the movie for you. The thing about all these old movies is you have to be in the right state of mind to watch them. It's all about the mood, and this one has a haunting quality that's rarely been matched. Even though it's tame for the most part, it sure does have some shocking moments for 1932. The flashback scene shows Imhotep being buried alive. That's a pretty disturbing thought, isn't it? By the way, when the mummy's discovered, where did his facial bandages go? Well, on the Blu-ray commentary track, Rick Baker points out that there are subtle traces of the bandages, suggesting perhaps that they rotted onto his face. Anyway, the most shocking moment of all is when the people who buried Imhotep are killed to keep the location of the tomb secret. They impale them! This is a 1932 film. You don't see anything like that. Also, actress Zita Johan shows a lot of skin. So, that's the original Mummy movie. Uh, the last thing I want to say, which makes it so unique, is that there never was a sequel. Unlike all the other Universal monsters that kept coming back, the original Imhotep mummy never rose again. It 
Dead Cinna Massacre's Monster Madness. The Mummy's Hand was made in 1940 during the second phase of Universal's horror cycle. The monsters of this period were usually more like reboots than sequels. The Mummy's Hand is no exception, having zero connection with the original film, although it does borrow some plot elements and recycles some footage, mostly the flashback scenes. This time, it's a different mummy named Karis, but his backstory is similar. He was buried alive for the sacrilege of stealing a sacred scroll that had the power to resurrect his mummy princess. So, rather than shooting all new flashback scenes, they just used the same ones from the original mummy with Karloff in the wide shots. They refilmed the close-ups with the new actor, Tom Tyler, best known for his cowboy roles. It's also interesting to note that the impaling scene was re-edited so that you don't actually see it happening. It was fine to show it in 1932, but in 1940, no way. I'm sure it had something to do with the Hayes Code, which went into effect in 1934. That's why all those early 1930s horror flicks had such morbid moments, like Murders in the Rue Morgue, to be the pride of science. and The Black Cat. Feel to hang on your own embalming rack, However, they do show Karis being wrapped alive and mention an additional grotesque detail that his tongue was cut out. They cut out his tongue so the ears of the gods would not be assailed by his unholy curses. Okay, I never imagined the mummy's curse to be literal. Oh, fuck! Shit! <laughs> Karis is kept alive over the centuries by the generations of Egyptian priests. Every time they get old and are about to die, they pass the job on to another priest. The new priest is played by George Zuko, a regular horror villain in other Universal films like The Mad Ghoul. How do they keep a mummy alive for so long? With the fluids of Tana leaves. Supposedly, anything more than nine leaves is too much. Should Caris obtain a large amount of the fluid, it would become an uncontrollable monster, a soulless demon with a desire to kill. Sounds like a grave warning, but never does he get nine leaves, so it never pays off. The reason they keep the mummy alive is to protect the tomb of the Princess Ananka, so unlike the first mummy, Imhotep, Karis is just a pawn to carry out their orders, kind of like Michael Myers in Halloween 6. That was a stupid idea. The archaeologists Steve Banning and Babe Jensen are hot on the trail of uncovering the tomb. These guys play it for laughs. They're like a poor man's version of Abbott and Costello. But then it becomes a comedy trio when they meet a magician named Salvani, who helps them fund their expedition. You're not Babe Zerby. Why does he have to be a magician? Just for some cheap laughs. <laughs> this movie is almost a full-fledged comedy, long before Universal actually made a mummy comedy, Abbott and Costello Meet the Mummy. Sylvani has a daughter named Marta who isn't happy about her father being involved, so she ends up coming along with the adventure to keep these guys in line. Let me go! The mummy begins attacking, and Marta's carried off. <coughs> Unlike the Imhotep mummy who wants the girl, this time it's the priest who wants her, and to make her immortal to preserve her beauty. You and I, together for eternity, here in the temple of Karnak. Then the heroes arrive in the climactic scene. Bullets are fired, flames are thrown, and everything's wrapped up nice and quickly. There's very little trace of that creepy mood that enriched the first movie, but I can't say it isn't entertaining. In fact, you might say it's more entertaining than the first movie, but in a cheaper kind of way. It moves along at a brisk pace and has more of an action-adventure feel. For example, the main characters are treasure hunters and they're being watched by spies. It certainly brings to mind the protectors of the Holy Grail in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. These elements of espionage and treasure hunting were very common at the time in film serials and Saturday matinee double features, all the films that inspired Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. 
and when Universal launched a new Mummy series in 1999 starring Brendan Fraser, they seemed to take more elements from The Mummy's Hand with all the action and humor. And of course, they had some Indiana Jones references as well, so what goes around comes around. The Mummy's Hand may not be a masterpiece like the original, but it has its own charm. It's never boring, and at one hour and seven minutes, you really don't have much to lose. That's a pretty short movie, isn't it? But guess what? It's the longest of all the Karis films. Yeah, so next time you're thinking about spending a few hours watching Gone with the Wind, you could be watching all the Mummy movies instead. It's Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. The Mummy's Tomb is a direct sequel to The Mummy's Hand, opening with a recap of the last film. To modern audiences, it seems like a cheap way to use up 10 minutes of its already short runtime. But keep in mind, back then, there was no home video. If you missed a movie in the theater, you missed it. The remaining 50 minutes of the film is set 30 years after the events of The Mummy's Hand. 30 years ago, and if incident. we assume the mummy's hand took place in the present time of 1940, then that would make the mummy's tomb set in 1970. Well, it sure doesn't look like 1970. We can imagine it is. Yeah. Karis is his name. Kicking ass is his game. The priest from the last film is still alive, played by George Zuko in aging makeup. Yeah, that's right, he's still alive. He got shot by four bullets and fell down a large staircase, shattering every bone in his body, but no big deal. One thing I find hilarious is some of the re-editing they did in the flashback to keep the pace moving along. Originally, right before he shoots him, he says, I'll give you to the count of three. One. You wouldn't shoot an unarmed man in cold blood. Two. But they cut out the three count. See here, you Egyptian Mickey Finn, I'll give you three to tell me where she is. I'm not kidding. Ooh, he suckered him! Anyway, he passes the job on to the younger priest, played by Turhan Bey, who for a while was one of the last surviving actors from the Universal Horror Films, but died in 2012 at the age of 90. Karis' new mission is, um, nothing more than to just kill off the rest of the archaeologists who invaded the tomb of Princess Ananka. But he doesn't stop there, he just kills anybody, just for the hell of it. All the characters who survived the last film are not so lucky this time. They're all killed off by a slow limping mummy crippled by fire burns from the last film who always somehow manages to back his victims into a corner. This time the mummy's played by Lon Chaney Jr. who you'll never recognize but it's nice knowing that our favorite monster star of the 40s is under those bandages. The priest decides to take a woman as his bride. You will be immortal. Even as Karis is immortal. But he's shot because that's the quickest, most convenient way to kill off the villain, and the mummy carries the girl away and is chased by the cliché townspeople with torches. Check out this guy. He falls on the torch. Did he get burned or what? It reminds me of Colin Clive in Frankenstein, who also falls on a torch. Did Universal have some kind of special safety fire or something? Final words, The Mummy's Tomb is a cheap, uninspired sequel. It doesn't do anything new with the franchise, but raise the body count. This is when it starts to feel more like a slasher series. But for any lover of classic horror films, it gives you exactly what you'd want. Nothing more, nothing less. You have the foggy cemetery, shots of the full moon, howling wolves, music recycled from the wolfman, an angry mob, and a fiery climax in a burning house. So, there's not much to complain about. It's Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. The Mummy's Ghost, 
Still set in 1970, in other words, 30 years after the mummy's hand, 30 years ago, George Zuko once again passes on the mission to a new priest, Yosef Bey, played by John Carradine. With all the members of the expedition dead, the goal now is to bring the mummies Karis and Ananka back to Egypt. How Karis survived the burning house, who knows and who cares at this point. You'd expect Karis to be more fragile by now, but no, he's like the Hulk. Well, the first half hour, Karis has no real agenda, nor does the film itself. That is until Karis and Yusuf Bey are about to reclaim the mummy Ananka from the museum, and all of a sudden, the mummy crumbles to dust. Why they can't show it is beyond me. These movies can show a guy turning into a werewolf, a skeleton turning into a vampire, but some bandages dissolving into dust? That's too much. Even Karis is pissed off about it. Look at him go! It's a little extreme, don't you think? The mummy just lost his cool. Maybe that's when they told Chaney he had to play the mummy for one more sequel after this. With all seriousness, playing the mummy was no easy task. Chaney had to be wrapped in bandages all day long, but not just that, but he was covered in liquid clay and dirt, making it one of his most uncomfortable and brutal roles. In the book, Universal Horrors, Chaney told fellow actor William Phipps on the set of The Indian Fighter that when he was playing the mummy, he would have a flask of vodka underneath his bandages with a tube running to his mouth, so all day he'd be sipping the vodka. Um, it's sad to think that he had such a horrible time that he had to get himself drunk, but the idea of a staggering vodka-sipping mummy is too funny not to laugh at. Anyway, after the Princess Ananka disappears, Yosef explains that the gods have given them more of a challenge, and they must find her reincarnation instead, similar to the plot of the original mummy. By thy will, her soul has entered another form. At the end of the film, Karis finds the girl and carries her away. He brings her to Yosef, who, guess what? Guess what every one of these priests did in the last few minutes of the film? He falls in love with the girl and decides to take her for his own. Yeah, yeah. Karis revolts against his master, throws him to his doom, and then is chased by the townspeople. In other words, the same old shit. But the movie completely redeems itself in the last minute. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. The girl dies. Yeah, just when you thought she was going to get saved and they were going to hug it out over the words, the end. No, no. This movie takes the conventional happy ending and throws it out the window. The girl actually turns out to be the mummy's reincarnation. Without any doubt or hypnotic suggestion, she is the mummy princess, and now it's time for her to start acting her age. That's a pretty scary looking corpse, isn't it? and they both sink into the swamp, and that's it. For once, the mummy and the girl actually do end up together in death. This movie had balls, and wasn't afraid to use them. Overall, I have mixed feelings about this one. It relies too much on copying the other movies, but it has some chilling scenes of Karis stalking about at night. And of course, a great ending. It's iconic in its own right, because when Hammer Studios made their version of The Mummy, they borrowed most heavily from The Mummy's Ghost. I think it's about as good as The Mummy's Tomb. Again, no masterpiece, but it's definitely a worthy entry in the series. Cinema Massacres Monster Madness. The Mummy's Curse. This is the final film in the Karis Mummy series, and you can see why, because the series completely ran out of steam. It opens in the same location where Karis and Ananka sank in the swamp at the end of the last film, except now the swamp is located in Louisiana. It's not uncommon for these films to ignore continuity, and if it helps change things up and keep it fresh, then so be it. Long ago there was a mummy, like you say, and he'd take a girl in the swamp. But it was 25 years past! Wait a minute, this takes place 25 years after The Mummy's Tomb and The Mummy's Ghost? 
which both took place 30 years after the mummy's hand, which would mean the mummy's curse takes place in 1995. Who would ever imagine they set this movie in a decade where the world was being littered with pogs and free AOL discs? When workers begin paving over the swamp, the people of the town are getting paranoid that the mummy's going to come back, but others dismiss it as superstition. Then a murder takes place and the mummy's shape can be found in the hardened swamp. The devil's on the loose and he's dancing with the mummy! That's this movie's catchphrase. The mummy's on the loose and he's dancing with the devil! Why'd he switch it around? Oh, whatever. Another priest, along with a sidekick, are now in control of the mummy. Once again, we're given a lot of exposition to get new audiences up to speed, and the whole flashback from the first two mummy films is shown again unabridged. Once again, the goal for them is to bring Karis and Ananka back to Egypt. The makeup on Karis is cheaper this time around. Jack Pierce made a mask because it took less time to put on and to give poor Lon Chaney a break. To this day, the mask is being preserved by longtime collector Bob Burns and is the last surviving piece of Jack Pierce's work in existence. Next, Ananka rises from the swamp. It's a real creepy sequence. It takes its time, savoring every ghastly moment. A walk in the water washes off the mud and reverts her back into a young woman. Next, Karis comes after her. Rather than embracing her old Egyptian lover, she runs. And basically what happens for the next 25 minutes is a slow chase scene, with Karis killing anyone who stands in his way. Finally, he catches her, carries her back to the hideout, which is an old monastery. The priest is happy until the servant brings an outsider in, which betrays his trust. Your tongue shall be torn from your mouth. They argue, the servant stabs his master. <laughs> the other characters show up, a knife fight breaks out, and everything is wrapped up in the last five minutes, in true universal fashion. After Karis twice survived being burned to a crisp, it's falling stones which finally do him in. As for Ananka, she reverts back to an ancient mummy. This is a stale and unimaginative finale to the Karis mummy series, but there are some good highlights, like all the mummy murder scenes and Ananka rising in the swamp. I also like the swamp setting, because it's nice to see something different. Roughly 10 years later, Universal resurrected the mummy again in this comedy, Abbott and Costello Meet the Mummy. But this time, the mummy's named Claris. Where will we find the mummy? Don't worry, the mummy will find you. Then, in 1959, Hammer remade the mummy in color with Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee in the role of Karis. This is by far the best mummy movie since the 1932 original. I highly recommend it. Hammer followed it up with The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, The Mummy's Shroud, and Blood from the Mummy's Tomb. These ones, not so much. Then of course, as we approached the new millennium, Universal relaunched the franchise as a CG-infested action-adventure series. The Mummy, The Mummy Returns, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, and the spin-off The Scorpion King. These movies are a product of their time, just as much as the old ones are. They're cheesy in their own way, but entertaining. We have a whole new week coming up, and that's going to be dedicated to another classic horror series, so stay tuned. Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Last sequel-a-thon, we talked about the Universal Frankenstein series. Now, it's Hammer Time! That's right, this week we'll be discussing the Hammer Frankenstein series. Curse of Frankenstein was released in 1957 and was Hammer's first color horror film. This is the movie that established Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee as the new horror stars for a new generation. It also put director Terence Fisher into the big leagues with all the masters like James Whale. 
Universal's Frankenstein was so famous, there was almost no point of remaking it. Whenever you mention Frankenstein, that's the version that comes to everyone's minds. So that's why you have to admire Hammer's effort, that they had the balls to remake it and to take it in their own direction. The opening prologue says, More than a hundred years ago, in a mountain village in Switzerland, lived a man whose strange experiments with the dead have since become legend. As if we didn't already know. All you need to say is Frankenstein. But I like it. It's taking a humble approach and allowing you to forget everything you know and start over again fresh and new. It starts out with Peter Cushing as Victor Frankenstein in a prison cell telling a story. We jump back to see him as a young pupil who looks nothing like Peter Cushing, learning about science under his mentor, a man named Paul. Hammer's favorite name. Afterwards in the Dracula sequels, they name their heroes Paul three consecutive times. When Frankenstein grows up, he and Paul continue to work together on science experiments. Their greatest achievement is bringing a dead dog back to life. We hold in the palms of our hands such secrets that have never been dreamed of. Frankenstein grows smarter and more ambitious and eventually decides to bring life to an inanimate human being which Paul thinks is going too far. Can't help me graft these hands on. It'll be interesting to see if they take. Can't you understand? I will not help you anymore. I like the mentor-pupil thing, but we all know what's going to happen. We all know Frankenstein creates a monster, but Paul taught Frankenstein, so perhaps it's he who created the real monster. It brings to mind Obi-Wan training Anakin, only to lose him to the dark side. At first, Peter Cushing is not as compelling as Colin Clive from the Universal Frankenstein. He doesn't quite match his mad stare and doesn't deliver as much memorable dialogue. But give him time, and Cushing slowly manages to surpass Clive, especially over the course of six films. A character is defined by his actions, while Clive's Frankenstein steals body parts from graves and a brain from a laboratory. Cushing's Frankenstein is so obsessed with his work that he's willing to sacrifice human lives. Victor, where is this brain to come from? I'll get it. He plans to use the brain of a genius and doesn't hesitate to kill him. If you step back a little, you'll see that. Look out, Professor, look out! What I don't understand, he landed right on his head. Don't you think Frankenstein could have killed him in a way that wouldn't damage the brain? Anyway, you get the sense that Frankenstein believes that he has good intentions, that he's doing this all for advances in the field of science. So he's not doing it just to be evil, he's just really obsessed. You killed him and now you're mutilating his body. Mutilating? I've removed his brain. Mutilating has nothing to do with it. What makes Peter Cushing a good actor is that he could play either a bad guy or a good guy. In the Dracula films, he plays the heroic vampire hunter Van Helsing. There's no major makeup change or anything. In both franchises, he looks almost the same. Whether he's opening a coffin to stake a vampire or to steal a corpse, he's the same guy. It's his performance that paints the picture of who his character is and his performance alone. Frankenstein and Paul get into an argument. Paul tries to take the brain away, and in the scuffle, the brain is damaged. Had Paul not interfered, the experiment might have been successful. This is your fault, Paul. I take Frankenstein's side on this. It was Paul's fault. I love the laboratory set. It's not as iconic as the Universal version, but the color photography gives it its own unique look. If this was a modern setting, it would look all white and bland and sterile, but instead, it's like one step above the room of a medieval alchemist. It looks primitive and crude, just as if Frankenstein really put it all together himself. The reveal of the monster's face is a real doozy. The monster's played by Christopher Lee, and from what I've heard, the first time Cushing met Lee, he was in the monster makeup ready to shoot. It wasn't the first time they were in the same movie, but it was the first time they shared the screen together. A match made in horror heaven. The monster looks very different from the Universal version, and that's because Hammer was afraid Universal would sue them. 
and it was probably for the best that they tried their own thing and didn't copy. That's what made it unique. Also, they refer to him as the creature, again trying to stay away from Universal's legacy. I like the look of the creature, but he doesn't have much interesting to do. The first thing he does after escaping is encounter a blind man. The monster doesn't speak, so the man feels threatened. He tries to defend himself, and then the monster kills him. It's as if they couldn't decide to make him confused and innocent, or a barbaric killer. It falls somewhere in between. The monster gets shot, and Frankenstein brings him back again. For some reason, now that the brain's been damaged even more, the monster's more obedient. There's a subplot that Frankenstein's been hooking up with his maid. She wants him to marry her, he laughs it off, and then she threatens to tell the authorities about his experiments. So, Frankenstein uses the monster's newfound obedience to kill her. Okay, he crossed the line. He's evil now. In the finale, the monster again goes out of control and attacks Frankenstein's bride, like in the novel. Frankenstein accidentally shoots the wife to death, but destroys the monster with the classic weapon of choice, fire. We end with Frankenstein being sentenced to death, but not before a visit from Paul, who does nothing to help. The creature I made! You know the man! Tell them! Paul's accompanied by the same girl who was Frankenstein's wife, suggesting that maybe the whole story was fabricated in Frankenstein's crazed mind. Paul! You must do it! Paul! Curse of Frankenstein is an excellent retelling of a classic story. It may get a little hokey once the monster is loose, but everything leading up to the creation is stellar. It ushered in a new wave of color horror films. Christopher Lee became their new monster star, also playing Dracula and the Mummy, and he made a career out of two things. Strangling Peter Cushing, and getting set on fire. <laughs> Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Unlike the Universal Frankenstein series, which followed the monster as the recurring character, the Hammer series focused on Frankenstein himself. It's an interesting concept to have a monster series without an identifiable monster. Instead, an anti-hero, or human monster if you will. And to cheat death, it's almost as if he is an immortal fiend. Revenge of Frankenstein picks up immediately where the last film left off, with Frankenstein being taken to the guillotine. The blade comes down and we cut to a bar where two drunks are contemplating trying to carry out some despicable deed. We don't have to break in anywhere, it's all in the open, nothing can go wrong. That's what she said the time before. We're not given any details, so we're left in suspense trying to figure out what they're talking about. It's like eavesdropping on a real drunken conversation. I'm going home. Of course, uh, the doctor did say that I mustn't do anything that might strain my heart. Just look at these guys. What great characters. Turns out their plan is to rob a grave. And not just anyone's, it's Frankenstein's. But he's not there. It's a priest! And then Frankenstein appears. Good evening. I am Baron Frankenstein. And literally scares him to death. We can assume that Frankenstein set them up and took advantage of the robber's heart condition, and then snatches his corpse. I always had mixed feelings about this opening. I thought it was kind of frustrating that they don't explain outright how Frankenstein escaped the guillotine, and it was kind of cliche with them robbing the grave in the beginning. It's kind of like the beginning of Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, and uh, they did it again in Friday the 13th Part 6 with Jason. Um, but, you know, as time went on and I've, as I've rewatched this movie, I've come to appreciate the beginning for what it is. Uh, it's also important to note that 
This isn't a straight up sequel that there's a lot of continuity differences. In the last movie, only a few people knew of Frankenstein's experiments, but this time the prologue says the whole continent breathed a sigh of relief when he was sentenced to death. But this made the film more interesting, that now Frankenstein is so infamous that he has to hide his identity. He now poses as a medical doctor named Dr. Stein. Nobody's gonna figure that out. There's a town called Frankenstein in Germany. Are you the Baron Frankenstein? Then there are the Frankensteins emanating from the town of that name in Silesia. Are you Baron Frankenstein? Well, it doesn't take too long. Yes. Pretty soon he has to confess it to his new inquisitive yeah, sure. assistant, Hans. Frankenstein has a lot of help this time. There's also an assistant named Carl, who is the one who somehow helped Frankenstein escape the guillotine, in return for Frankenstein to fix his hunched back. The plan is for Frankenstein to transplant Carl's brain into a perfect body, and this time Frankenstein's gotten a lot better at stitching together dead limbs. His new creation barely has a scratch. Still, his methods are crude. He has eyeballs in a glass tank and an arm, which are cheesy as hell, but that brain, that's pretty gruesome for a movie made in 1958. There isn't much of a monster this time. When Carl's brain is switched into the new body, everything seems to be working fine. You've made wonderful progress in the past week. But there's a complication, well, more than one. Doctors and scientists will come from all over the world to see you and to talk to you. All my life I've been stared at. First, as soon as Carl learns that he's going to be famous, he runs away because he doesn't want the attention. Next, he burns his hunchbacked body, but is caught by this real crazy janitor who thinks he's a burglar and takes the opportunity to beat him up for fun. Afraid I gotta bust your skull in, are you? <laughs> now I'll have to hit you some more to make up for all the damage you just done. Carl retaliates with the savageness of a wild beast. We can assume the beatings from the janitor cause brain damage on Carl, turning him into the monster. At least, that's what I get out of the scene. But if that's not enough, the same brain transplant experiment is done on a chimpanzee, which causes the chimpanzee to develop a craving for raw meat. So Carl, too, develops this craving and goes on a flesh-eating rampage. Carl crashes a party, calling Frankenstein by name publicly Frankenstein. before dropping dead. Next, Frankenstein is sitting in a room full of people, fending off accusations that he's the infamous doctor they all think he is. Have you ever consulted a street directory, sir? Any street directory for any town in Central Europe. You will find dozens of Frankenstein. I am a Frankenstein. Obviously, they're all right. But what I love about this scene is that Frankenstein puts up a compelling argument and makes them all sound foolish. It's one of those awesome Peter Cushing moments. How do you explain that wretched fellow calling you Frankenstein? For the very same reasons as your own, I should imagine. Then we pile on another awesome and suspenseful scene where Frankenstein's patients all slowly revolt on him. It's a real nail biter. Finally, they unleash their fury. They beat Frankenstein to a bloody pulp. His assistant Hans, who had little purpose in the plot, now becomes necessary. He transplants Frankenstein's brain into a new creation, which Frankenstein already revealed prior to this as having his own likeness. So Hans puts Frankenstein's brain into the Frankenstein double. The authorities inspect the corpse and are certain that Frankenstein is finally dead. Well, the body must be taken and buried in unhallowed ground. But he slipped away and cheated death once again. What a cunning bastard. The only thing that doesn't add up is if he could switch bodies, why would he put himself in the body that looks exactly the same? Wouldn't he want to look different so no one would ever know who he is? Oh, and guess what his new name is? Your next patient is waiting, Dr. Frank. Oh, my God. Dr. Frank. <laughs> Dr. Frank. Oh, it never ends. Well, anyway, I love the ending. I love it so much that I'm able to 
forgive most of this movie's flaws. It's incredibly cheesy and it borrows a lot of plot elements from movies like House of Frankenstein with the doctor promising the hunchback a brain transplant. So there's nothing that original going on. But Peter Cushing just knocks it out of the park. I swore I would have my revenge. All the supporting characters, no matter how minor, are all great. I'll teach you. I like how it raises the stakes. Not only does Frankenstein have to deal with the dangers of his experiments, but also with the people who are trying to figure out his identity. It's a great, if not perfect, sequel, and it's just about as entertaining as the first one. Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Revenge of Frankenstein left off with the Doctor cleverly switching his brain into another body to escape the authorities. This opened up the door for all kinds of possibilities. What new tricks would the Doctor pull off this time? There was a great foundation to build off of, but with Evil of Frankenstein, they threw it all in the garbage can and needlessly rebooted the series. The only connection is that Frankenstein has an assistant also named Hans, which is really confusing. Nothing else ties in. It's obviously not the same character, so why couldn't they give him a different name? This was the first of the franchise to not be directed by Terence Fisher, but instead Freddie Francis, who also directed many other Hammer films. Now for an interesting turn of events. For this film, Hammer joined forces with Universal. That's right, a Hammer Universal co-production. This allowed them to make the monster look more like the Universal version that everybody recognizes. It's definitely no Jack Pierce job. This monster is a poor imitation. He's played by New Zealand wrestler Kiwi Kingston. Even Lon Chaney Jr. in Ghost of Frankenstein was better than this, and he did almost nothing. Now for something positive. The sets are magnificent. It seems the budget's gotten much bigger, and this might have the best looking laboratory sets of the whole series. While it's a visually spectacular entry in the series, I can't say so much about the plot. It begins with Frankenstein and Hans working on another experiment when a priest barges in to confront them. Because that's what priests do. They always destroy everything. Frankenstein and Hans have to leave now that they've been discovered, and they go to the town of Karlstad, where Frankenstein once worked. We're told in flashback the story of when Frankenstein first created a monster, which went on a rampage and escaped, eventually disappearing into a crevice. Like I said, it doesn't follow the other films, so there's no good reason why this had to be a flashback at all. Also, it doesn't seem necessary why Frankenstein has to go to his old laboratory. He's not conducting his new experiments there. The reason he goes there is to sell off his old belongings so that he can fund his new experiments. But that whole part of the plot goes out the window because it turns out the lab's been ransacked. So instead, the attention turns to the monster, which they find covered in ice. Ice that looks like cellophane. They revive the monster, but the monster doesn't obey commands. So Frankenstein gets the help of a hypnotist, but the hypnotist has vengeance issues and uses the monster to kill his enemies. Go back and kill him. The plot seems to be a rehash of different elements from the Universal films, like in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, with the monster being discovered frozen in the ice cave, and Frankenstein's lab being abandoned. The evil hypnotist controlling the monster and commanding him to kill people is like Igor in Son of Frankenstein. And the whole climax with the exploding laboratory, just take your pick, it's like any of the Universal films. You can call it stale or pleasantly familiar. You can look at it as a best of Universal Frankenstein repackaging done in color. It's often considered to be the worst of the Hammer series. I don't think that's necessarily true. It depends what you're expecting from it. If you're expecting it to break new grounds and progress the series forward, you'll be disappointed. But if you're looking for all the classic cliches, then you'll enjoy it. The best way I can sum it up, if this makes any sense at all, it's the most Frankenstein of the series. It's 
Cinna Massacre's Monster Madness. Frankenstein Created Woman has Terence Fisher back in the director's chair, so many would say this is a return to true form. The plot is a lot more original than Evil Frankenstein, it's not at all predictable, but it may be a little bit too weird. Frankenstein's experiments have gotten so advanced now that he's moved past the point of transplanting brains, now he's trying to transfer the soul. How does he do that? With a satellite dish. This takes it beyond the ordinary science fiction genre and into some kind of supernatural direction. It's nice they're doing something different for a change, but this is a little bit too bizarre. Take a guess what the assistant's name is. Hans. It's Hans! They named him Hans three times in a row! The Dracula series were all about Paul, this one's all about Hans. Anyway, Hans isn't just some side character, in fact, he's kind of like the main character in the movie. As a young boy, he witnessed his father being executed for crimes he committed. Seeing that as a kid would sure fuck anybody up in the head, but it's not that important to the plot anyway. Hans has a love interest with a girl named Christina who has a disfigured face. Her father wants Hans to stay away from her. And keep away from my daughter in future. Why he would not want anyone to show his disfigured daughter any affection, I have no idea. He's just some asshole who wants to keep her in the house. Speaking of assholes, three guys show up at the father's bar that he runs. This is one of the greatest scenes in the movie. Landlord, wine. The best. Or the best that your establishment can offer. At first, they just seem like real snobby customers, but things escalate and they become real troublemakers. Get out of my sight! I don't know what these guys' problems are. They behave like children. First, they're making fun of Christina, and then they're drunkenly yelling at her window. Hans confronts them and ends up cutting one of their faces with a knife. That keeps them away momentarily, but later they break into the bar and they're caught by the barkeeper, so they beat him to death right in his own bar. What is the deal with these guys? They remind me of Alex and his droogs from A Clockwork Orange. Hans is blamed for the killing, and things turn into a courtroom drama. What does any of this have to do with Frankenstein? Nothing yet, but it's the most entertaining aspect of the film. I'm totally invested in wanting to see if he gets proven innocent or not. Well, things aren't looking good. The quarrels he's had with the barkeeper, the fact that he left a jacket at the bar, and the scar he put on the man's face all play against him. They also bring up the fact that his father was a criminal. Like father, like son. As if crime is in your genes, fucking idiots. I do not care to talk to the spawn of murderers. I don't want your type hanging around her. Hans is executed, and Christina, just out of the blue, happens to be riding past the old guillotine Hans. when she sees her boyfriend's head being cut off. I guess history has a weird way of repeating itself. She commits suicide, so that's two dead bodies, and here's where Frankenstein comes in. He extracts the soul from Hans and puts it into Christina's body. So that's how Frankenstein gets the bodies. A much more elaborate backstory than just digging up some graves, wouldn't you say? And for good measure, he fixes up her face. I have the suspicion that the creation scene has been cut, because there exist a ton of publicity stills of the she-monster half-naked with Peter Cushing and a slab. It's all over the posters, on the home video covers, everywhere. I guess that's all it was, was one big publicity shoot. Well then, that's gotta be the most memorable scene from a horror film to never exist. Now she's out on the run on a revenge mission against all the bad guys. She seduces them one at a time and brings them into a room like they're about to have sex and then kills them. Kill! 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 Now keep in mind, this is the soul of Hans in her body. It reminds me of when Bugs Bunny dresses up like a girl to attract Elmer Fudd. At least I thought Hans was inside the girl, but then he starts talking to her. Kill him. Kill him, Christina. So, is it like some kind of schizophrenic thing? Kind of like in Fry the 13th when Mrs. Voorhees thinks Jason's talking to her? Kill her, Mommy. Kill her. Don't let her live. I won't, Jason.
But wait, that's not all. She has the head of Hans up on her dresser, which looks hilarious by the way. It's a static image of a head being photographed against the same wallpaper. Today you can do a better job with Photoshop. But anyway, if Christina is talking to Hans, but Hans' soul is in Christina, then really it's Hans talking to his own lifeless head. It doesn't make any sense. There had to have been some kind of substance abuse involved when they came up with this shit. You know who loves this movie? Martin Scorsese. No kidding, Martin Scorsese once picked this as one of his favorite films. Well, it's anything but boring, and has some good things going for it. Even though the plot is completely ridiculous, there's something profound about the mistake Frankenstein made. He messed with the soul and body of two people who had emotional baggage. To Frankenstein, it didn't matter. Their emotions and how the experiment would affect them was no concern of his. All he wanted was to do it in the name of science, but he forgot about compassion. After Christina murders all the men and commits suicide for the second time, Frankenstein walks away, perhaps having learned a moral lesson. It's a convoluted, yet interesting addition to the series. It's Cinna Massacre's Monster Madness. Frankenstein must be destroyed. How's that for a hokey title? Unlike Dracula, Frankenstein is a mortal man. He could be killed. Isn't the word destroyed a little extreme? The opening scene is just as hokey. Frankenstein is out decapitating somebody's head for his next experiment. Meanwhile, a robber sneaks into his lab. Frankenstein comes back wearing a scary mask, wrestles with the guy a bit, and he goes running off. This scene is good old campy B-movie fun. But why does Frankenstein have to wear a mask? I mean, come on. Just like in the beginning of Evil of Frankenstein, he leaves town because his secret lab has been discovered. He goes to stay at a boarding home under the name Dr. Fenner. Finally, it's not Dr. Frank or Dr. Stein. One of my favorite scenes is when he's sitting in a room with a bunch of strangers who are all scoffing at the idea of brain transplanting. Frankenstein turns around and puts them all in their place. I didn't know that you were doctors. Doctors? We're not doctors. I beg your pardon. I thought you knew what you were talking about. The way he tells them off is perfect. It's another one of those amazing Peter Cushing moments. Had man not been given to invention and experiment, then tonight, sir, you would have eaten your dinner in a cave. You would have strewn the bones about the floor and then wiped your fingers on a coat of animal skin. In fact, your lapels do look somewhat greasy. Good night. Frankenstein finds out the landlady's fiancé happens to be selling cocaine to make a living, so he blackmails him to help him with his experiments. Believe it or not, the unwilling assistant's name is not Hans. In fact, there's no character named Hans anywhere in the movie. Instead, his name's Carl the same name as the hunchbacked assistant in Revenge of Frankenstein and one of the troublemakers in Frankenstein Created Woman. Yeah, Hammer had a Rolodex of three names for all their characters, Paul, Hans, and Carl. Anyway, Frankenstein's mission this time is to figure out how to freeze a brain. See, he already knows how to transplant a brain, but now he's trying to figure out how to keep the brain alive outside the body for a long period of time. His old colleague, Dr. Brandt, knows the solution, but for some reason his work drove him insane, and now he's in a mental asylum, unable to speak. Frankenstein wants to know his secret. So, with the help of Carl, Frankenstein sneaks Dr. Brandt out of the asylum to operate on his brain and cure him of his insanity. So, Frankenstein knows how to operate on a brain to cure insanity, but he doesn't know how to keep a brain on ice? I'm not a scientist, I don't know what would be more difficult, but doesn't it seem like Frankenstein should be a genius? How would this Dr. Brandt guy know something he doesn't know? It undermines how clever of a character Frankenstein is supposed to be. Well, Dr. Brandt suffers a heart attack all of a sudden, which puts an unexpected time limit on Frankenstein's plans. If Brandt dies, his brain dies. So Frankenstein switches to plan B, transplant the brain into another body. 
He can cure insanity, but he can't cure a heart attack? I hate this part of the plot. It's too complicated and it's not interesting enough to even care about. We've seen Frankenstein transplant brains before. We've seen him transfer the soul. So this isn't very progressive as far as sequels are concerned. And where does the second body come from? Professor Richter. Basically some random guy we don't care about. What about the landlady, Anna, played by Hammer Babe, Veronica Carlson? What does Frankenstein need her for? You don't need her. Let her go. I need her to make coffee. Oh, so she's the coffee girl. Is that it? I'd like some coffee, Anna. Well, no, there's something else he uses her for, too. I don't even want to tell you what it is, but I guess there's no skipping around it. There's a scene where Frankenstein rapes her. Please leave my room. It comes out of nowhere. Give me that key. I know Frankenstein's supposed to be without compassion, but this has nothing to do with his experiments. This makes him out to be too evil. It went way too far. Supposedly, both Cushing and Carlson, along with director Terence Fisher, all hated the scene. They didn't want to do it, and it wasn't even in the damn script. Supposedly, from what I was able to gather, it was executive producer James Carrera's idea to sex up the movie. Sex it up? With a rape scene? It's not sexy, it's disturbing! Especially coming from a scrawny, feeble-looking Peter Cushing. What was he thinking? What is Frankenstein's ultimate goal, anyway? If his experiments are successful, would he publicize them? All the bodies and brains he stole would be known. He would face murder charges and now add rape to the list. So I don't know, maybe he's just willing to serve life in prison in the name of science. With everything this movie has going against it, the last act makes up for it. Dr. Brandt's wife comes in and Frankenstein tells her that her husband's been cured and is now sane. What he doesn't tell her is that it's not the same body. He's all wrapped up and can't speak yet, so he communicates through hand gestures. He answers some simple questions from her and confirms that it is indeed her husband. Then Frankenstein relocates again, but sloppily leaves behind the original body of Dr. Brandt. Mrs. Brandt happens to come across it and is horrified. <laughs> This is genuinely heartbreaking because we, the audience, know that her husband is still alive in a different body, and we desperately want to see them reunited. Talk about lack of compassion. Frankenstein is a real asshole, and this makes for great entertainment above your average horror fare. Just like all of Frankenstein's creations, Bran escapes and goes to find his wife. But when he speaks to her, she doesn't believe it's him. I met my husband days ago. Who are you to contemplate such a dreadful joke? I am your husband, Ella. Brain, of course, isn't too happy that Frankenstein transplanted his brain without his permission, so he has reason to seek revenge. Also, Carl is out for him, too, because Frankenstein stabbed and killed Anna because she stabbed Brandt, a minor incident that wounded but didn't kill him. But before I get buried in all the details, let me wrap up this review and talk about the ending. Brandt sets a trap for Frankenstein, setting a house on fire. He insinuates that the secret to keeping brains in suspended animation is written down somewhere in the house. Wrong door. Probably in his journal or something. I can only imagine what's written down in there. It probably just says, put it in a freezer. It's a cat and mouse game. Brandt is on a suicide mission, ready to lose all, just to take down Frankenstein. In one of the funniest moments, Frankenstein flees the house only to run to Carl. Brandt wouldn't know who Carl is. He has no frame of reference. He's just some other guy who hates Frankenstein too. But fuck him, this is his revenge. It ends with Brandt carrying Frankenstein into the burning building to die in the flames like all the classic Frankenstein movies do. In a nutshell, this is a great sequel. It's a little shaky at first, but the final act is excellent. For the fifth film in a franchise, it's not bad. It's 
Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. In 1970, Hammer rebooted both the Dracula series with Scars of Dracula and the Frankenstein series with Horror of Frankenstein. I don't really count Horror of Frankenstein as part of the series, not so much because it's a reboot. You could argue that all the Hammer Frankenstein movies are reboots because they all throw out continuity. The only thing that connects them all is Peter Cushing, and that's what Horror of Frankenstein is missing. This time, Frankenstein is played by Ralph Bates, one of the underrated actors in the Hammer films. He always gives an intense performance, like in Taste the Blood of Dracula as the guy who wants everybody to drink Dracula's blood. Drink, do you hear me? Drink! In Horror of Frankenstein, his best moment comes when his friend gives him the typical rant that his experiments are going too far and will come of no good. You're tampering with forces we don't fully understand. Instead of arguing, Frankenstein just says, Okay, fine. I'll stop right now. Well, I suggest we dismantle the apparatus. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. Then if you will start with the terminals, I'll begin over there. Yeah, yeah, go, go stand over there. Then he fries them. Veronica Carlson is in it from Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, and Dave Prowse, who plays the monster, went on to play the monster in the following film as well. So even though Horror of Frankenstein isn't part of the Peter Cushing series, these recurring actors connect it all like dominoes. Dave Prowse is the same actor who played Darth Vader in the original Star Wars trilogy. The look of this monster is simple, just a muscular guy with stitches, but it works. It's monstrous enough without being silly. The downside is that he doesn't have much interesting to do. He just wanders around with that same blank expression. Seems like these Hammer films could never get a good enough monster. It's not a bad film by any means, but not a memorable one either. In 1973, Peter Cushing returned for one final entry in the series, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell. You gotta love these cheesy titles. This was the last film for director Terence Fisher. It centers around a young medical student, Simon, who tries to follow in Frankenstein's footsteps. He's punished for body snatching and is sent to an asylum. At the asylum, he happens to meet Frankenstein. Cushing's age makes his face appear more feeble, which works to its sinister advantage. But that wig has got to go. Frankenstein is still conducting his experiments, posing as the asylum surgeon, under the name, ugh, Dr. Carl Victor. So it's another Carl and it's Frankenstein using his first name as his last name. Anyway, it's pretty coincidental that Simon just happens to meet his idol there. Impressed with his medical skills, Frankenstein takes him on as his assistant in creating a new monster. He gets all the body parts from his patients. And apparently from the fucking zoo! This is the monster? Why is he covered in hair? Oh, the monster from hell. <laughs> Looks like fucking hell. What was Frankenstein trying to do when he made this thing? It doesn't click with the serious tone of the rest of the film. It's almost as bad as the giant claw. The monster, like I mentioned, is again played by Dave Prowse. Funny to see him and Peter Cushing reunited in Star Wars. Enough of this. Vader, release him. As you wish. <sighs> I love the grim tone of this movie. The madhouse is a dismal, ugly, and claustrophobic setting. Instead of trying to be campy and fun like the other films, this one takes a bold, serious approach that is dark and depressing. I really want to like this movie for these reasons, but it just doesn't do anything for me. It does nothing new for the franchise, it's just Frankenstein creating another monster, almost deliberately this time. There's no interesting twists, nothing unexpected happens, and it moves at a very slow and uneventful pace. Frankenstein is introduced about 20 minutes in, the monster at 45 minutes. And following that, there's about a 15 minute duration of the monster being operated on, lingering on every gruesome detail. The ending is a complete farce, with the monster being shot in the balls and then ripped apart by all the inmates. It's an underwhelming closure to the series. Around this time, Hammer was winding down, just as they breathed new life into the horror genre in the late 50s. Now, in the early 70s, a new breed of horror films were taking over. Think about it, this movie was released the same year as The Exorcist. 
The Frankenstein series may be dated now, but it's still one of the most interesting horror series to feature an anti-hero. Any future Frankenstein remake should take a hint from the unique ideas explored in these movies. You could take the best elements of all these films and put it all together, just like the Mad Doctor himself. Like in the Dracula series, trying to track down all these movies on home video is a mess. Curse of Frankenstein is owned by Warner Brothers, Revenge of Frankenstein is owned by Columbia, Evil of Frankenstein is owned by Universal, Frankenstein Creed Woman is the only one that's still retained by Hammer and was released on an out-of-print DVD by Anchor Bay. Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed is owned by Warner Brothers, and Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell is owned by Paramount. I don't know why so many other companies own the rights to Hammer films, but it would be nice if Hammer was able to release them all in one package. But then again, Hammer only releases everything in Region 2 because they don't want the rest of the world to be able to watch them, no. Region coding doesn't make any sense. Well anyway, tune in tomorrow and we're going to look at another monster series, and this monster is in the big leagues. Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. You know this had to happen eventually. Yeah. For Monster Madness, we must honor one of the biggest monsters of all. The friend of all children. The brave, invincible, super monster guardian of the universe. Gamera! Ah! Ever since I did the Godzilla-thon, I've been getting tons of requests to review the Gamera series. I'm glad I waited because since then, Shout Factory released them all on DVD. Before then, every DVD version of these movies were garbage. This is what they looked like before, and this is what they look like now, thanks to Shout Factory. Also, they've been restored back to their original Japanese cuts. These are the kind of movies that are meant to be watched, so you should see them on your own. Uh, reviewing them's kind of difficult because all I can do is explain what I'm seeing. Flying turtle, spaceship, lasers, boom, boom, boom. I'll just sound like a lunatic, but so be it. Um, Gamera was made by the film studio Daie. This was in the mid-60s when the Godzilla franchise was at its peak and all kinds of giant monsters were coming out of the woodwork. And in many ways, the Gamera series is a lot like the Godzilla series. Both series start in black and white. Both monsters are awakened by a nuclear bomb. Both monsters start as villains but become heroes. And both series were rebooted, bringing the monster back to a villain, but also a defender at the same time. For these reasons, Gamera has always been sort of in the shadow of Godzilla. It gives the impression that Gamera is the poor man's version, kind of like Transformers and GoBots. Nobody cared about GoBots. So let's give Gamera some love and respect. We're going to look at the seven classic Gamera films from the original series. I'll lightly touch upon the reboots at the end, but we don't want to spend half the month on one monster. Anyway, the first film from 1965 was called Gamera the Giant Monster. The US version was Gamera the Invincible, spelled with two M's. Yet another strong similarity to Godzilla is that both U.S. versions of these films were heavily re-edited and added American actors. Although when Gamera was released on VHS in the 80s, the U.S. version was re-re-edited, this time cutting out all the American actors, any of the new footage, and this time being a lot closer to the Japanese cut. These VHS tapes were marketed towards kids. Collect six of our Just For Kids videos and in the beginning of the tape, there's a really funny introduction with a kid who tells you how to adjust the tracking on your tape. Hi, I'm Noel. You're going to love this Just For Kids video. If you're having a little trouble with the picture on the TV now, maybe you just need to adjust the tracking on your VCR. That's the little switcher button just at the bottom of your tape there. If you need help, just call mom or dad or big brother or big sister. They'll help you. I don't mean to get off topic, so let's move on. The movie begins somewhere in an arctic region with a plane being shot down. 
The plane was carrying some kind of nuclear bomb. When it explodes, it awakens Gamera, who had been hibernating in the ice. The movie offers very little explanation beyond that. We all know by now, nuclear bombs awaken giant monsters. Most movies would have spent a long time setting up the plot, but no, no. This one doesn't dick around. It introduces Gamera right away. In both the original Japanese version and original US version, once Gamera appears, that's when the credits start. But on the VHS version, the credits are moved to the beginning, and when Gamera comes out of the ice, there's no credits. This happened to be the first version I saw as a kid, so I thought this was really weird. Like, wow, they're really showing him off. Like, what the hell are we looking at? A grilled burger? So, Gamera goes around causing lots of destruction. The military tries to kill Gamera, but there's a kid named Toshio who won't have it. He loves Gamera. Why? To begin with, he just loves turtles, like the famous internet meme. But this kid is the original. He has a good reason, at least, because Gamera saved his life. But Gamera pretty much kills everybody else, so Toshio is just a selfish shithead. The military starts up Plan A to set off explosions that flips Gamera on his back. I guess the line of thinking is, once a turtle's on its back, it's fucked. Yeah, just like Toshio's mom. But they didn't stop and think, this is no ordinary turtle. What the fuck? Yeah, it's common knowledge now that Gamera is jet-powered, but imagine if you were watching the movie for the first time. It comes as a surprise. Right at the 40-minute mark, it's a unique twist. This is one of the things that sets it apart from Godzilla, that um, Godzilla makes a little more sense. I mean, it could never happen in real life, but Godzilla fits the traditional description of a fire-breathing dragon. It's a familiar, mythical concept, but Gamera is just so out there. It's a flying fucking turtle! Roger Ebert, in his review of the 1995 reboot, said it best when he observed that Gamera is not a mechanical creature and never needs to refuel, so we can assume the jet blasts come from byproducts of organic material. These are Roger Ebert's words, the king of movie critics who said, yes, Gamera is powered by farts. Awesome. The rest of what happens is pretty standard for a monster movie. The defense agency holds a meeting to figure out what to do about Gamera. Meanwhile, the monster rampages through the city, which are some great effects scenes, on par with many of the monster films of the time. Finally, the grand plan goes into effect, which I find to be an absolutely hilarious way to stop the monster. They launch him into space. In fact, they send him to Mars. That's pretty original. You don't always have to kill the monster. Just get rid of him. Make him somebody else's problem. If there's Martians living there, they're in for a surprise. Well, Gamera's debut film may be a little typical, but for a movie of this genre, it's very competent and well-made. It would have been more groundbreaking had it not been following in the mighty footsteps of Godzilla. But in its own right, it's a great example of the genre. Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Second in the Gamera franchise, the series makes the jump to color with Gamera vs. Barugan. Just like many of the Godzilla films, it had two titles. It's also known as War of the Monsters. Why would they try to hide the fact that it's a Gamera movie? Taking Gamera out of the title is just as idiotic as when they changed Godzilla Raids again to Gigantus the Fire Monster. Also, like the second Godzilla film, it's the first where Gamera fights another monster. I don't mean to keep connecting it to Godzilla, but the similarities are endless. 
Also, the monster that Gamera fights is a complete ripoff of Baragon, a creature from the Godzilla universe who was first featured in Frankenstein Conquers the World, also known as Frankenstein vs. Baragon. I mean, come on, Baragon and Barugon? Well, one thing original here is that Barugon shoots deadly rainbows. You know what? I can accept a jet-powered turtle that spins like a fan, but shooting deadly rainbows? That's just stupid. With two monsters on its hands, this movie surprisingly takes a while to get things going. The plot focuses a little more on the human characters, for better or for worse. The rocket that was carrying Gamera to Mars got hit by an asteroid. Gamera, now free, heads back to Earth. Meanwhile, a group of treasure seekers go into a jungle region to find a rare gem in a cave. The natives warn them to stay away from the cave because it's in the dangerous Valley of Rainbows. Ooh. First, they have to fight their way past the natives, then encounter quicksand, and finally reach the cave. During this time, it's more like an adventure movie. They find the gem, but one of them is a greedy bastard who allows the rest of the group to die. He gets away with the gem, but the one last survivor left in the cave gets nursed back to health by the natives, who explain to him why it's so bad that the gem was removed. To make a long story short, the gem is an egg, an egg that hatches the monster Barugan. Barugan begins tearing shit up at roughly the 40 minute mark. Boom! Boom! Barugan can also use his tongue as a weapon. Then we go back to the asshole who let his friends die, who gets accused of murdering, and this escalates into a big domestic violence scene. Then we're back to more Barugan destruction and learn he can freeze things too. This creature gets more interesting all the time. Then at roughly the 55 minute mark, Gamera finally shows up again to fight Barugan. It's not clear that Gamera is a full-blown hero yet, he's just there to claim his territory. It's the same concept as when Godzilla fought Anguirus. They were like two animals acting out their natural instincts. In fact, it's exactly like this scene, especially with the pagoda in between them. The fight moves kind of slow. The monsters spend a lot of time sizing each other up. Barugan freezes Gamera, and Gamera retaliates by cutting Barugan, who bleeds purple. Gamera is frozen for a while, so the movie once again focuses on Barugan and the humans who are having their own fight. The survivor from the cave-in meets his murderous friend, and they duke it out. It's actually more exciting than the monster fights. Then there's the age-old scenes talking about how to stop Barugan. They try to lure him into a lake with a diamond. But our favorite asshole shows up to steal the diamond just as they're acting out their plan. Great timing, dickhead. And then he's deservingly killed by Barugan. It always makes these movies more interesting when we have a human villain. Then there's a bunch more military scenes. They come up with another plan to deflect Barugan's rainbow back at him. It sort of works, but Barugan learns by his mistake and doesn't fire any more rainbows. Smart monster. With nothing left to do, Gamera shows up for the rematch, and the two monsters fight it out to the end. Whew. Well, that's the movie. Has it hold up? Well, it depends which way you look at it. For me, personally, I think it's one of my least favorites. The reason is because, from this point on, the series got even crazier. I was introduced to Gamera through Mystery Science Theater 3000, and I've come to recognize the series for its comical elements, insane-looking monsters, ridiculous special effects, and off-the-wall fight scenes. With the exception of the deadly rainbow, Gamera vs. Barugan is more grounded. It's a little more typical for a monster movie. I prefer the Gamera movies when they're wacky as hell. But if you like the human elements and having a more sound plot, this one holds itself together pretty well. So you can view it as one of the best or one of the worst.
It's Cinna Massacre's Monster Madness. Third in the Gamera series, Gamera vs. Gauss was released in the US as Return of the Giant Monsters. Because it's required by law that all Japanese monster movies have to be renamed for US audiences. Gamera happens to be a big fan of volcanoes, so when a volcano erupts, Gamera is all over it. Then we're introduced to a room full of businessmen who are building a highway and are trying to force country people to move out of their homes so they can build over their properties. This starts a big dispute over money, but soon they have bigger things to worry about. A helicopter gets cut in half by a laser. The laser is of course from the monster Gauss who we're introduced to pretty soon. Gauss seems to draw its inspiration from Rodan, so it's yet another example of Daie imitating Toho. Both monsters have great wingspans and cause heavy gusts of wind. But Gauss is a bit more like a giant bat than a pterodactyl, and as we already noted, shoots lasers. Gauss tries to eat a kid, but Gamera shows up and saves him. The two monsters fight for the first of three times in the movie. The laser cuts through Gamera's arm. It looks like the arm's about to get sliced off. Gamera fights back by doing this real cool rolling move, then breathes fire, and then retreats. Guess what happens next? Gamera takes the kid to an amusement park. I just want to see Gamera buy the kid cotton candy. Then we get a briefing on what Gauss is, what his anatomy is like, he has two throats in case you wanted to know. Other than that, there's not much in this scene that you learn about Gauss. You'd know more just from watching the rest of the film. For instance, Gauss drinks blood. There's actually a scene where they use a giant vat of blood as bait. And he hates sunlight. So basically, Gauss isn't just a bat, he's a vampire. How's that for an explanation? The hell with the scientists. Planes try to take down Gauss, but he cuts them all up nice and clean. Then wreaks havoc on the town. Boom, boom, and more boom. The coolest thing about Gauss is how perfectly he can cut things. Check out this scene where he cuts a car in half, and the people continue to drive the half car. It's one of the most amusing comical moments of the film. Then Gamera shows up and fights Gauss for the second time. They take the battle to the air. Lots of spinning, lots of lasers, lots of boom. The fight ends when the sun comes up and Gauss has to retreat. But Gamera bit off a piece of Gauss's foot. This is when we learn something else about him. His body parts regenerate. I like how you always keep learning new things about the monsters. The scientists examine the foot, figure out that sunlight kills it, and try to come up with some plans to get Gauss into sunlight long enough to kill him, one of which involves making him dizzy so he can't fly back to his cave. It doesn't work. The other plan is to create a forest fire. This attracts Gamera, who comes back again and takes care of things. The final fight is the best yet, and ends with Gamera violently dragging Gauss into a volcano. As for the whole dispute about the highway project, it all gets resolved. Like, hey, we almost got wiped out by a giant laser shooting vampire bat. Let's put our greed aside. Who cares? This is the most boring aspect of the movie. You could cut out all those scenes and it wouldn't affect anything, other than make the movie more entertaining, which it is. You have three monster battles, you have great special effects. This is a Gamera film that delivers. It has a memorable monster villain who would become the only recurring monster in the Gamera films. Every time the series was rebooted, Gauss was brought back. In the original series, the same costume was painted silver and reused because of budget constraints as a different monster in Gamera vs. Giren. If Gamera has an arch nemesis, it has to be Gauss, making him the Ghidorah of the series. This movie took a lot of the traditions that started with the other two movies, like Gamera helping out a kid and Gamera being temporarily defeated by the monster villain's powers. This one put it all together and made it the official Gamera format. The plot with the villagers sucks, and all the scenes of the scientists and military are just the same old bullshit. But if you're in it for the monster scenes, this one does not disappoint. It's 
Cinna Massacre's Monster Madness. Fourth in the Gamera series, check this out. The movie doesn't waste any time. It starts off in space with a weird looking spaceship. See, this is the kind of stuff I love. This is how I like my Gamera films. There's aliens talking about how they want to take over Earth. I guess those are aliens talking. Something's talking. Is that thing the alien? Are the aliens invisible? Neither is correct. Anyway, they go into detail explaining why they want to take over Earth, how the Earth is the most similar to their own planet and has all the resource they need. They explain it all as if this is a totally new concept for us, as if this isn't already the plot of every other Alien Invader movie. Then Gamera shows up, and I love how they introduce the title. Watch this. Yeah, Gamera vs. Space Monster Virus known in the U.S. as Destroy All Planets, to cash in on the success of Destroy All Monsters, the Godzilla film released that same year. Boy Scouts are visiting scientists who have a tiny submarine. Two boys manage to get on the sub and go on a little undersea voyage. They happen to see Gamera, and of course, Gamera just loves kids. The scene goes on and on. It's fun time with Gamera. Then the aliens come back and trap Gamera inside some kind of force dome. They want to figure out how to control Gamera, so they do a memory scan so they can learn everything about him. You know what that means. Flashback. We get to see the fight scenes from Gamera vs. Barugan and Gamera vs. Gauss all over again. If you haven't seen the previous films, this is a good way to catch up on the series. It crams in a lot of bonus monster action. The flashback goes on for about 10 minutes. In the US version, it's twice as long. A 20 minute indulgence of stock footage. It's a cheap way to burn off more of the film's runtime, but hey, would you rather have this or more scenes of scientists and military men talking? The aliens kidnap the kids. Let me point out two things that I like about this direction the series is taking. One, it's outer space themed. We spend a lot of time aboard the alien ship and see all kinds of imaginative production design. Two, this is the first Gamera movie where the kids are the main characters. I think this makes the series more fun to watch because it puts you in a child's perspective, which is the right frame of mind to enjoy these movies. These kids say Gamera all the time. When we eventually do see the aliens, they're pretty interesting, with glowing eyes and flying arms. Looks like a piece of meat from a Tom and Jerry cartoon. The aliens take control of Gamera with a brainwave device, very much like the plot of Godzilla vs. Monster Zero, and send him to destroy Tokyo. Cut to more stock footage from the first Gamera film. Now it's getting ridiculous. The first movie was in black and white, but they give no regard to this whatsoever. The kids manage to beam themselves down from the ship and help Gamera break free from the aliens' control. The aliens reveal their true form and all merge to become the squid-like monster, Virus. Amazing! Gamera destroys the alien ship and then fights Virus on the beach. This is what we all came to see, but the movie's been so entertaining up to this point that this is just a cherry on top of the sundae. The big highlight of this fight, for me, is when Virus stabs Gamera with his pointy head. It's pretty brutal, but that's not what I'm talking about. Just wait. 
Gamera flies into the air with Virus still impaled into his body. And now for the greatest what the fuck moment. That's the best thing I ever saw. Take that image and put that on a t-shirt. Out of context, that could really confuse somebody. What the hell is that? Fifth in the Gamera series, it's Gamera vs. Giran, known in the US as Attack of the Monsters. Why do none of these alternate titles have Gamera in it? It's like they didn't want people to know it's a Gamera movie. The movie begins talking about star clusters and galaxies, then scientists talking about, well, space. Then we cut the kids looking through a telescope who happen to spot a spaceship. The mom comes in and tells them to do their homework. This brings you back to an innocent time when kids didn't have things like video games to keep them occupied. They looked to the stars and used their imaginations. This is when the idea of space travel was like the coolest thing ever. And it still is. We just forgot, that's all. Perfect. Grown-ups have no dreams. Sums it up right there. The kids go exploring and find the grounded spaceship. They go inside. I guess the aliens are out for the day and they have no trouble operating the thing. They go taking off like it's nothing. Ooh, I'm telling mom, you took a spaceship. So they make it to outer space. Every kid's dream. They actually did it. Next thing, Gamera saves them from an asteroid. And you know what time it is. It's Gamera fun time. Next thing, they lose control of the ship. It ends up taking them to a distant planet where they witness Space Gauss fight against Giran, a monster with a saw on his head. Supposedly, they ran over budget, so they had to paint the old Gauss costume silver rather than creating a new monster. But I think it makes up for it with Giran. The saw on his head is 100% unique. It's not just for decoration either. He uses it. A lot. First, he deflects Gauss's laser, cutting off his foot. Then Giran cuts off his wings. Then decapitates him. And then slices him like pepperoni. Would you consider this scene too gory for children? Would anybody take this seriously? Well, apparently somebody did. The US version, released by AIP, removed any scenes that they thought were too violent. But when they were re-released for home video, marketed for kids, they put the scenes back in. And these were the same versions they used on Mystery Science Theater 3000. Ah, quit while you're ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ah! But all those bargain DVDs were the butchered AIP versions. Nowadays, you can get the fully restored Shout Factory versions. Those are the ones to get, without a doubt. The kids go exploring inside the alien headquarters, where the production design shows off. It's wonderful and cheesy. Then the aliens show up. Space girls. Gotta love the costumes. It gets even better. These space girls want to eat the kids' brains. They put one of the kids under hypnosis and ask him some questions, but the only thing on his mind is bagels. That's what happens when you have an open mind and an empty stomach. Then the kid tells them all about Gamera. You know what that means. Another flashback. Already this movie has been borrowing every plot element from Gamera vs. Virus, so why not the stock footage flashback scene as well? This one's only about three and a half minutes. Anyway, Gamera comes to the planet to rescue the children. The aliens unleash Giran, who's under their control. The two monsters fight. It's one of the most awkward monster fights ever. 
These are my favorite shots when it's far away. Look at this picture. Look at what's going on here. Time for monster villain superpower number two, Ninja Stars. First time I ever saw a monster put ice on its wounds. Look at this editing, by the way. What just happened? Gamera was standing on ice. Now all of a sudden he's in the water. The monsters jump all around in slow motion. Might have something to do with the gravity on the planet. And the main highlight, let's see how many times Gamera can go around the pole. One, two, three, four, He's gotta go back around. Was it that important to show how Gamera got the momentum? Couldn't they just use a cutaway and then come back to Gamera flying off the pole? Then when Gamera gets stuck with more ninja stars, he dances. And it goes on and on. Okay, fine, yes, he's doing the go-go. Every shot lingers for way too long. That's what makes this fight scene one of a kind. It's so bad it's good. The grand finale is when Gamera sticks gear and saw into the ground. Catches a missile and throws it into his head. What can be said about this movie? It's bonkers! The plot is basically a rehash of Gamera vs. Virus, but you can't go wrong. You have cheesy special effects, flashy spaceship interiors, a monster with a saw on his head, and space girls who want to eat children's brains. It's the perfect essence of cheesiness. Good stuff. Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Sixth in the Gamera series, it's Gamera vs. Jiger. <sighs> the alternate title is Gamera vs. Monster X. In other words, Gamera vs. Generic Monster that we can't remember the name for the fucking title. <sighs> Monster X. It's like when they change Godzilla vs. Mothra to Godzilla vs. The Thing, or with Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, how they called it the Cosmic Monster and the Bionic Monster. It's Mechagodzilla! Call the monster by its fucking name! It's also interesting to note that the name Monster X was used for a monster in Godzilla Final Wars, which actually turned out to be King Ghidorah. The plot centers around a boy named Hiroshi whose father- What?! Why does he have a Hitler mustache?! Anyway, this guy's been building a submarine for some kind of science expo. That's what these movies are always about. It's either a spaceship or a submarine. But that gets put on the back burner for a while. We get a cool slideshow about ancient civilizations and a statue called the Devil's Whistle. That sounds foreboding. Of course, they want to remove it from its island and put it on display at the expo. We all know that's going to summon some kind of monster. It's very much like the plot of Gamera vs. Barugan when they take the egg. Gamera shows up right away to stop the expedition, but they manage to take the statue away. Then the monster Jiger makes its appearance. Looks like something from the dinosaur age, and not as wild and inventive as some of the other monsters we've seen. The first thing it does is get a drink of water. That makes perfect sense. If you've been sleeping in a pile of rocks for ages, you'd be thirsty. It's funny that most monster movies would never address that. The only thing we need to see now is a monster take a shit. Gamera shows up and fights Jiger. Man, every time the humans screw something up and awaken another monster, Gamera's always got to deal with it. Gamera does pretty well until Jiger reveals the mandatory surprise attack, where she shoots spikes into Gamera's limbs. Now for the traditional Gamera's in trouble phase. 
This time it's the spikes that keep Gamera from retracting his limbs, which means he can't fly. Next, of course, Jiger starts destroying the city. Then the planes come in to take her down, as if that ever worked. One of the most awesome effects is when Jiger shoots some kind of death ray that turns people into skeletons. Meanwhile, Gamera finally gets the spikes out of his body and takes flight. Match 2 takes place in the city. It has lots of great explosions and cartoony moments, like when Jiger uses a piece of a building as a seesaw to throw Gamera into the air. Once again, Gamera gets wounded. This time, Jiger injects Gamera with some kind of parasite. Gamera goes into some kind of frozen state. Then we have the mandatory scientists gather around a projector scene. They explain what's going on with Gamera. Basically, Jiger sort of impregnated him with a baby Jiger. Just to demonstrate, the scientist shows them documentary footage. Real documentary footage, I might add, of an elephant that had some kind of larva eggs hatch inside its trunk. What happens here is so disgusting, I'm not even going to show the clip. They show real footage of the elephant's trunk being slit open and larvas spilling out. Who wants to see that? It's gross. I mean, it's not that bad. It's in black and white. But how does that explain what's happening to Gamera? How is that necessary? Anyway, remember that submarine? It finally becomes useful. The kids take it and go inside Gamera's body to find the baby Jiger. <laughs> They accidentally figure out that it can be killed by the static noise from their walkie-talkie. Then guess what? We get another science lesson. This is one of the cliches in these movies that gets really old. Like, okay, we get it. That's the monster's weakness. Remember the scene in The Blob? When they find out the only thing that can kill the blob is anything that's cold. Hey, that's it. It's cold. That's why it didn't come in the icebox after it said, can't stand cold. Do we need a whole scene explaining it? No, he just says, everybody, get some CO2 fire extinguishers, and that's it. That's how you do it right. Anyway, they restore Gamera back to life using an electric charge from power lines, and then match three takes place. Now comes one of the more absurd moments of the film. Jiger uses her death ray, Gamera is able to block it, but the noise it causes is so powerful that Gamera has to shove telephone poles into his ears. He shoves them in far, too. Ouch! The fight continues. Gamera finishes off Jiger by stabbing her in the head with the statue. This is one of the gorier Gamera films, especially with the gratuitous elephant trunk surgery. It's no wonder why it wasn't released on the Just For Kids VHS tapes. But anyway, uh, how does the movie hold up? Has some great effects? But that's about it. It doesn't take the series in any new direction. It's the same basic stuff. It's Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Seventh in the Gamera series, it's Gamera vs. Zigra. As far as the alternate title goes, it's usually just Gamera vs. Zigra. Wow! Although I've heard that there is another title, Gamera vs. Deep Sea Monster Zigra, just in case we needed to differentiate it from all the other Zigras. This one takes it back to outer space. In fact, it begins looking like a live action version of an Atari 2600 game. Boom! This time, the villain is a space girl who's commanded by a shark head on the ceiling covered in cobwebs. The whole set looks like it was recycled from parts of the Gamera vs. Giren set. Even the costumes look the same. It probably is. The spaceship is underwater. That's right, it's underwater now. Some kids are on the surface in the middle of Gamera fun time when the ship shoots a beam of light that transports the kids aboard. The space girl explains to them that they're going to take over the Earth so Mr. Sharkhead can inhabit the waters. Yeah, before more dust and cobwebs form on him. The big problem, and the reason they view Earth people as being so evil, is because they pollute the waters. That's right, we have an anti-pollution message going on here, just like in Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster. Save the Earth! Save the Earth! Save the Earth! 
both films came out in July of 1971, but this time Gamera came first, by only a week. The kids escape the exposition extravaganza and have some more Gamera fun time. Then some planes get shot down by the spaceship. You gotta have that. Then the space girl gets beamed down to the surface with one mission to kill the two kids. Why? Because they know all their secrets. Well then, why did she tell them in the first place? She uses a hypnotic spell on people. The first thing she uses it for is to steal some clothing. Terminator style. The first people she happens to see are wearing bikinis, so now she's going around like that. In other words, no longer needs the hypnotic powers. She finds the kids and chases them through an aquarium. They stop her by making noises into a walkie-talkie. It turns out she's a regular Earth girl who was under hypnosis herself. The control was broken by the walkie-talkie. The mastermind was of course Mr. Sharkhead, who I'll start calling Zigra now because that's what he is, the monster villain of the film. Gamera destroys the submarine spaceship, or whatever the hell it is, and out comes Zigra's true form. The two monsters fight underwater. I've never been that big a fan of underwater monster fights. They're always so slow and look dark and murky. Fortunately, they take it topside real soon. Zigra starts standing upright. I love how he has so many sharp points on his body. He's like a switchblade knife. He zaps Gamera with his beam of light, immobilizing him for a while. The series' time-honored tradition. Then scientists talk endlessly about it. They descend into the ocean and try to awaken Gamera with sonar waves, but not before they're attacked by Zigra. This is one of the slowest moving parts of the film. I would have rather just had one really good monster fight instead of all this. Finally, Gamera wakes up and rematches Zigra. It ends with another goofy highlight. Gamera plays Zigra's back like a xylophone. So, how does this movie stand up? The best way to say it? It's just tired. I like the monster, but the fight scenes are lacking, and there's nothing about the movie that really makes it stand out. By the time you get to the seventh film, it just ran out of steam, and that's the way most film franchises are. So this marks the end of the classic Gamera films, depending which way you look at it. In 1980, there was Gamera Super Monster, which was one part Gamera Clip Collection and one part Star Wars Ripoff. And when I say Star Wars Ripoff, I mean, just look at it. It also seems to try to cash in on the Superman craze of the time. The superhero women here are trying to defend the Earth from aliens. But who needs them when you have Gamera? Most of the footage of Gamera is all stock clips from all his previous monster fights. It has Barugan, Gauss, Virus, Giran, Jiger, and Zigra. No monster is forgotten. From this standpoint, I think it's a good Gamera movie to watch if you only have time for one, because with this, you get to see all the highlights. There is some new footage. Did you ever expect to see Gamera go head-to-head -head with a Star Destroyer? Not to mention, there's a weird singing kid. Yeah, I don't know where else to fit that in. And the funniest moment of all... Yeah, that just happened. Whew, well, 
That wraps up the classic Gamera series, but that's not the end of Gamera. Tomorrow, we're going to take a day and just breeze through the next generation of Gamera films. It's in a massacre's monster madness. We just covered the classic Gamera series, but there's more. We can't go too in-depth because that would be almost half the month. We have more monster series to get to, so we gotta move on. So let's finish off with a quick look at the newer generation of Gamera films. In 1995, the same year Godzilla was beginning to take a brief hiatus, after Godzilla vs. the Tutoroya, Gamera picked up the slack with a revival trilogy. The first was Gamera, Guardian of the Universe. This was a kind of Gamera film we've never seen before. It was more serious and darker in tone. It also marked the return of Gauss. Some of the compositing effects are kind of crappy, but all the miniatures are very impressive. Look at the detail here. It's amazing! I now know firsthand how difficult miniatures are to shoot and what a dying art they are. It proves Gamera's potential as a monster series that packs a real punch. In 1996 came Gamera 2, the advent of Legion. The effects got even more ambitious with lots of moving shots. Not to mention, it totally ups the destruction level. Damn. What sticks out to me the most with this film is the monster. Legion may be the most complex creature in the whole series. Who designs a monster like that and expects it to work? Well, it did. It worked well. Keep in mind, this is not CG. There's actually people inside that thing. Gamera has really met his match this time. In 1999, Gamera 3, The Awakening of Iris, closed out the trilogy. As far as effects go, holy CG. Some of the effects look like cutscenes from a video game, I can't even tell what I'm looking at. But many of the effects look great. Gamera looks more badass than ever. And there's lots of low angle shots emphasizing how big and menacing he is. Overall, it's shot very well. The one thing I really don't like is all the digital shaking of the camera. They use this effect all throughout the movie. It goes way too far. Gamera's first enemies are a bunch of members of the Gauss species, but that's only part of it. The plot centers around a girl whose family was killed by Gamera, so she's on a quest for revenge. It's a good change of pace to have someone who hates Gamera instead of a young boy who's obsessively in love with him. She finds an egg that hatches a weird monster. When I say weird, that goes for every monster in the series, but this one is really weird. It turns people in a village into horrific corpses. Then it grows into its full form, which is a pretty interesting looking monster to say the least. The girl develops some kind of mythical bond with Iris as he fights against Gamera. The fight scenes aren't as awesome as with Legion, but it's still pretty good. I wish these movies would have came out in theaters here in the US instead of the 1998 giant lizard movie from TriStar that happened to be named Godzilla. It was the one time when Gamera was truly on top. At last, in 2006, there was Gamera the Brave. This one was another reboot. It does the unthinkable. It kills off Gamera in the first three minutes. The rest of the film centers around Gamera's son named Toto. He's discovered by a young boy when he's only a baby turtle. Seeing a giant turtle flying around is strange, but a tiny, realistic-looking turtle is somehow even stranger. He watches the turtle grow up until he eventually becomes Gamera size. He doesn't look mean and badass like the old Gamera. This one is cute, sort of like what they did with Godzilla's son. The monster named Zetas appears. It's not that unique of a monster, just a lizard that jumps around with a spear tongue, but the suit is really well done. In fact, all the effects in this film are top notch.
It's not as dark as the 90s trilogy. It's kind of a throwback to the generally lighter tone of the original series, but with better child actors who do more than just yell Gamera all the time. The best way I can describe this movie, it's the most mainstream of all the Gamera films. It's more kid-friendly, and it goes for that cute, heartwarming feel. There were never any sequels. This is a standalone film, the only Gamera movie of the millennium so far. But then again, it's not Gamera, it's Toto. When will we see another Gamera film, and will we ever see Godzilla vs. Gamera? Only time will tell. That's it. Tomorrow we start a new monster series, a true terror from space. For now, say goodbye to Gamera. Cinema Massacres Monster Madness. This week we'll be talking about the Alien franchise. When I say Alien, you know exactly what I mean, and that's the power of this film. It takes a title that's as generic as Alien and makes it into a household name. We'll start with the first Alien film, directed by Ridley Scott. It was released in 1979 at the heels of horror blockbusters like The Exorcist, Jaws, and most recently, Halloween. The horror genre is a genre that usually doesn't get much respect, but with all these films of the 70s, they were finally able to get mainstream attention. Much like Halloween, Alien is a slasher film about a killer with a body count. The only difference is that the killer is an extraterrestrial life form and the setting is in outer space, where, as the tagline says, no one can hear you scream. It's brilliant. The plot is simple. A cargo ship returning to Earth picks up a signal from a nearby planet or moon, and they go down to investigate on company orders. They bring back an alien on board, which gets loose and starts killing the crew. That's the basic gist. Doesn't sound too original, does it? It's the same plot as It, the terror from beyond space. A space crew picks up an alien and it goes on a killing spree aboard the ship. Alien is a rehash of old ideas, but it's done so well that it feels fresh and new. When they arrive on the surface of the planet, they find the wreckage of an alien ship that crashed long ago. Just seeing the image of the ship, there's something strong and foreboding about it. Somehow it helps looking at it through that fuzzy monitor. What a memorable scene. As they approach the ship, you just know that something bad is going to happen. It's no different from the classic haunted house scare. Don't go in the house. Don't go in there. You're going to die. Once they go inside, it continues to get more interesting. We explore the ship's dark secrets, but don't get any clear answers. We see a giant room, which we assume is the cockpit. In the pilot seat is a fossilized alien creature with a hole in its chest. I'll never forget that slow zoom in on the face. We never figure out what this thing is, but we know that something bad happened there. Then we discover a bunch of eggs that the ship was carrying. Why was it carrying these eggs? Well, that's the beauty of this film, that nothing is explicitly answered, and the more times you view it, the more guesses you can make. Ridley Scott said on the commentary track that these eggs which soon we learn contain a deadly life form known as the face hugger, which plants an egg inside of its host, but don't let me get ahead of myself. Uh, he said that the aliens that were flying the ship were probably transporting these eggs somewhere to use as a weapon. Against what? There's already one type of alien that we don't learn much about, not until the film Prometheus, but we'll get to that later. But also, there's something else out there, and probably something beyond that, the point is, it's a never-ending story, and it makes the universe seem so much larger, something that only the best science fiction films manage to do. Anyway, there's a lot of suspense going on here. Nothing happens for a long time. 
not many films could get away with that. The audience would get bored. But here, nothing is ever boring. It lures you in to its first surprise. It startles you without any excessive music, and I think it works so well because it takes so long before it gets to this point. And when the egg hatches, it looks so realistic. There's nothing cheesy about it. It looks organic and real. Just the same as the character is curious to see inside, so are we. So they bring this guy back to the ship with this creepy thing attached to his face. They can't get it off. It bleeds acid, which burns through several floors of the ship. Already, this is pretty terrifying, but then the face hugger dies and falls off on its own, but not before planting an egg inside the body. So, basically, he's been impregnated, and the face hugger is like the rapist of the universe. But then everything's fine. Oh, wait. I'm eating this. Oh, shit. Oh, God. It's fucking horrifying, and it still is. I can't think of anything more disturbing than a living creature inside your body ready to burst out. So now there's a little alien running around the ship somewhere, but guess what? It also grows really fast. It seems that only a few minutes pass before it's bigger than a human. What's so clever about this is that unlike a lot of the alien movies from the 50s, this alien is always changing its appearance, so you're always wondering what it looks like. In all the other movies, you see the monster once, and from that point on, you know what it is. How about the jaw inside the jaw? That's pretty freaky, isn't it? The creature was designed by H.R. Giger, and it's one of the scariest looking monsters ever put to film. The production design by Michael Seymour is also excellent. Every shot is a work of art and you feel completely immersed in this world. Can you believe those are glass paintings? The ship is a dark and claustrophobic maze. It's disorienting. I don't think I'd ever be able to find my way around that place. That's another deep fear it preys on, the feeling of being trapped in one place. In real life, very few people get the chance to go in outer space, but I wonder if everyone had the opportunity, how many people would actually want to do it? The concept of trapping a bunch of people in a place that's away from civilization is not new. In the old dark house, a bunch of strangers gather in a house while a really bad storm rages on outside, and a landslide blocks the road. In The Thing from Another World, it's a bunch of scientists on an expedition in the North Pole surrounded by nothing but ice and snow. In Jaws, they're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. It's all the same. Whether it's a shark or an alien coming to get you, you're stuck with it. There's nowhere to go. I still think the movie is stronger before the alien starts killing people, because after that, it sort of becomes victim to some of its horror trappings. When the engineering technician, Brett, goes wandering off on his own, we know that he's going to get killed. It's very predictable. This is only a minor weakness in the overall film. My point is, I like the first act better for its slow and suspenseful build-up. Interesting to think that I like when nothing is happening better than when stuff is happening. It's one of the first science fiction movies to realistically show space travel. There were only few films before it that had such great special effects, like 2001 A Space Odyssey and Star Wars. It was also one of the first to show artificial intelligence in such a convincing way. One of the members on the ship turns out to be an android. He's very advanced, almost identical to a human. This was before Terminator. The company's secret mission, unknown to the crew, was to capture and bring back one of the aliens. The android Ash was programmed to make sure that the mission is a success. I used to hate this part. I thought it was an unnecessary attempt to give the movie a twist to differentiate it from its B-movie trappings. But now, I think it's one of the more interesting aspects of the film. The company wanted the alien to use as a weapon, just like the other aliens on the ancient shipwreck, so history repeats itself. And what a scary concept, to use that thing as a weapon? Dropping one of those eggs on an enemy territory would be worse than an atom bomb. The aliens would wipe out any population. Now, assuming the company knew what kind of aliens existed on this planet and sent an unprepared crew over there, how did they plan to bring it back and how would they control it? 
Obviously, it was a half-cooked scheme and it wasn't successful. And to use those aliens against your enemy would only be spreading a new enemy that's even worse. The characters are very convincing. Usually in these science fiction movies, the people who fly ships are super intelligent, speaking a lot of high-tech jargon, but here, they're just common, working people. Flying a ship is just like driving a truck. That's how far into the future we are. Our star is Sigourney Weaver, playing Ripley. She's the last survivor, just like Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween. Usually the macho hero character was always a guy, but this movie showed us that a female can be just as badass, so it broke new grounds. To sum up Alien, it's distinctly a horror film and a science fiction film. It perfectly balances the two and in both categories reaches its full potential. Now, we're going to talk about the rest of the Alien franchise, but what about Prometheus? I guess I'll never get the chance to talk about it, so I might as well cover it now. Technically, it's not a sequel, nor is it a prequel to Alien. It's just a film set in the same universe that runs parallel to it. Prometheus, released in 2012, attempts to shed some light on what was that creature in the cockpit. Ridley Scott returned to direct and to further explore his universe that he created 33 years ago. Even though the film was made 33 years after Alien, it's set about 30 years before it. If you haven't seen this movie, you might consider some of this to be spoilers, so if you want to see the movie for yourself, then just, you know, turn off the video now. Go watch the movie. Archaeologists discover a star map in a cave that leads them to a distant moon where they discover the same kind of ship that was discovered in Alien. Here we learn about the space jockeys, as they're called. They're referred to as engineers and supposedly created human life on Earth. That's a pretty interesting concept. To summarize, the rest of the plot would be to explain every weird thing that happens in this movie. It has a scene that is just as disturbing, if not more disturbing, than the original alien chestburster. This time, the heroine must remove a different kind of alien from her womb. It's shown in excruciating detail, and man, is it horrific. To sum up what I like about it, it's the production design once again. I love the world that this movie inhabits. It's a feast to the eyes. Beyond that, it's a good science fiction thriller, but not as groundbreaking and will probably not go down in history as a classic as much as Alien did. This film is still pretty recent, so I need more time to evaluate it and let it sit with me. It has some strengths and some weaknesses. There's one little detail that I really hate. One of few concrete things I can actually point my finger at. Why couldn't they get an old man to play an old man? About its connections to Alien, this is something that fooled a lot of people into thinking this was going to be a prequel leading into the events of Alien where we find that shipwreck. Nope, this is not the same ship. Sure, it crashes at the end of the film, and this looks like the same moon, but it's not. This is LV-223. That was LV-426. Ooh. Any casual viewer would assume that this is trying to connect the dots to Alien, but nope. They leave it wide open for another sequel. The first thing to tip you off is that the space jockey doesn't die in the cockpit. And when that alien bursts out of his chest, of course we'd all like to think that this is the first alien of its kind, the xenomorphs. But nope, this alien has nothing to do with the eggs on LV-426 and whatever it was that came out of the pilot's chest. Remember, he was fossilized, and that ship crashed thousands of years ago. Prometheus only takes place 30 years before Alien. Not to mention, we see murals on the walls showing the xenomorphs, meaning they must have existed long ago. It's no wonder why everyone was confused. Well, anyway, let's get on with the Alien films. Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Making a sequel to a groundbreaking film is never an easy task, but when director James Cameron was assigned to it, he nailed it. Nailed the shit out of it. Aliens was released in 1986. That's uh, about seven years after the first one. 
That was back when they took time to make sequels. Nowadays, by the time a movie gets to the theaters, they're already working on the sequel. Aliens still masters its horror and sci-fi elements, but adds the action genre into the mix. The whole idea of there being more than one alien this time was the perfect hook. We saw what one alien could do, now, holy crap. It begins with Ripley, fresh from her escape at the end of Alien, awakening from a frozen sleep, only to find that she had been floating around in space for 57 years and had only then been rescued. She learns that a terraforming colony has been sent to the same moon where her crew first encountered the hostile alien species. Now, the colony's been living there for 20 years, and they've never found the aliens. Until now, all of a sudden, they lost contact with the colonies, so a team of military personnel are sent in to investigate, with Ripley as their advisor. So that's the speed version of it. The characters are all very convincing, even with Bill Paxton hamming it up. How do I get out of this chicken shit outfit? He's the funny guy, and somehow the movie's able to get away with taking him so far. We're some real pretty shit now, man! The characters joke around and trash talk. Have you ever been mistaken for a man? No. Have you? <laughs> it's very natural. It feels like this group has spent a lot of time together. And supposedly they did. James Cameron insisted on the actors getting to know each other weeks before shooting began. Ripley's the outsider of the bunch, and she's the one that we identify with the most because she's the only one who's seen the alien before and knows of its deadly force firsthand. One of the most memorable characters to me is Vazquez, who's like a female Rambo. Also, there's an android named Bishop, played by Lance Hendrickson. Because of her bad experience with androids, Ripley has a prejudice against him, but eventually needs to lend her trust. The first act matches the same level of suspense from the first alien. We know that this team is way too confident and have no idea what they're in for. As they investigate, the suspense builds and builds. It reminds me a lot of the opening of Them from 1954, which concerns giant killer ants. The police investigate a smashed up house. Like aliens, it's very slow and suspenseful. They find a little girl who witnessed something horrifying, but she can't even tell them what happened because she's so traumatized. In Aliens, the same thing happens. They discover a little girl named Newt. Her whole family's been killed, but she's too frightened to elaborate. Aliens works off these old conventions. Just like the first Alien, it takes a lot of cliches from the 50s and molds them into something that's fresh and new. It also seems to invent some new cliches of its own. All the Marines have body cams, putting you in their perspective. Doesn't this make you think of all the found footage movies that came later, like Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activities? When the aliens begin attacking, it's like a roller coaster ride, but the suspense always comes first. It never feels like a straight up action movie. It unloads just enough firepower at a time to keep you ready for more. Take this. The aliens themselves look better than ever. You only get brief glimpses of them in the darkness. I remember seeing this as a kid, I was always eager to know what they looked like. Like the best of monster movies, it doesn't give away too much too soon. As soon as I think of this movie, the first thing that comes to mind is the color red and strobing lights. This is the look of the film, which adds to the feeling of disorientation and madness. Also, there's a character named Burke who's working for the Wayland Company. The same company from the first film that wanted to capture the alien. Yep, they're still at it. If you've seen the first film, you know exactly what's coming. And so does Ripley. She doesn't take any shit. These people are dead, Burke! One thing I'm not sure about, has the Wayland Company been trying to pull this off for the past 57 years, or is it just a second time coincidence? The final act, Ripley has to do battle with the Queen Alien. This is another scene straight out of Them, where they use a flamethrower against the Queen Ant and its eggs. The Queen Alien looks fantastic and is proof that the most amazing special effects are done in front of the camera without computer animation. Stan Winston's company worked on this thing. It stood 14 feet tall, two people were inside it, and several more controlled it using rods, cables, and hydraulics. 
The film escalates to an exhilarating finale with a double climax. The less said, the better. See the movie for yourself. One thing that's great about this movie is that you don't need to see the first one to know what's going on. It fills you in very quickly. And since it's a little more action-oriented, it seems to attract a wider audience, which helps act as a gateway to introduce more people to the first movie. A lot of people saw the sequel first, including myself. This movie put the Alien franchise into our pop culture. Several movies ripped it off, and it's been parodied in cartoons like Ninja Turtles. It came out during the big video game revolution. This was the Nintendo age when video games were becoming more advanced. Several of them got their inspirations from the Alien films such as Metroid, Xenophobe, and especially the Contra games which make blatant references to not only the facehuggers and the xenomorphs, but also the space jockey from the first Alien. And is this thing from Metroid also inspired by the space jockey? The tie-ins this movie has with video game culture is summed up in one line. It's game over, man. It's game over. As a kid, I laughed my ass off because it was the first time I ever heard a character in a movie make a reference to video games like that. He applied video games to real life in a time when our society was becoming so immersed in video games that the line between game and reality was beginning to blur. Or it's just a funny line. Simply put, Aliens is a great sequel, one of the best sequels ever made. It's debatable if it's better than the first or not. They both have their special merits. So, fuck the review, just watch the movie. Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Alien 3, or Alien to the Third, was an unexpected sequel. How do you top Aliens? The answer? You don't. It seems the number 3 is often an unlucky number with sequels, and this one's no exception. Right from the start, there was a lot of trouble with the project. Many different writers and directors were involved with it. When David Fincher was assigned to the directing task, he had little time to prepare, didn't even have a finished script when they started shooting, and the studio interfered with a lot of his decisions. Lots of film productions are troublesome, but all that matters is what comes up on the screen in the end. And Alien 3, unfortunately, isn't that awesome. After Ripley survived the events of Aliens, along with Newt, Corporal Hicks, and what's left of the android Bishop, you'd think they'd get a little break. But nope, the ship has a fire and they crash on a planet. Nobody survives the crash except Ripley. All these characters that you rooted for in the last movie are all dead. Even the little girl is dead. It's like a cruel joke. Even worse, this is a prison planet full of criminals and rapists, with Ripley being the only woman. With everything the character has been through, you'd think there'd be some light at the end of the tunnel. But no. Alien 3 immediately drops her into hell and starts off on a depressing note which sustains for the entire film. When I saw this for the first time when I was about 12 years old, I couldn't even stand to watch it. This movie is so depressing it'll make you want to blow your brains out. After re-watching it, I've tried to appreciate it for its somber tone. This bleak atmosphere is what characterizes the film. I'm all about mood but with this one, it only goes so far. The plot is nothing special. Ripley begins to suspect that another alien was aboard the ship and is now running loose on the planet. Any opportunity for suspense is ruined because right from the opening credits, we're shown the facehugger crawling around the space pod. We know exactly what happened. Ripley activates Bishop to ask him what happened, and when he tells her an alien was aboard, it's like, yeah, duh. The only new information he gives us is that the Wayland Company knows what happened because the ship records everything. We know what they're up to. They want to get the alien. So now Ripley isn't just fighting for survival. She's fighting to keep the company from getting the alien. I like that. This time the face hugger impregnates a dog. So the alien that comes out is supposed to be dog-like. This is an aspect of the aliens that had never been addressed until now. They're called xenomorphs because... 
That's exactly what they do. They morph into whatever animal they spawn from. This was an interesting idea and had a lot of potential, but it doesn't amount to much. The first few times I've seen the movie, I didn't even notice that the alien was supposed to be dog-like. But I see it now. It walks on all fours. I get it. There's another cut known as the assembly version, where the alien comes out of an ox. So, for the rest of the film, the alien could be acting like an ox or like a dog. In other words, it never mattered. There's something about the alien that doesn't quite look right. For a while I thought it was CG, but it's actually a puppet in front of a blue screen. That's why it looks so different. In many shots, it's a suit with an animatronic head. Inside the suit is effects man Tom Woodruff Jr., who used to work for Stan Winston on too many films to count, including The Terminator. He was a regular monster player. He was the Gill Man in Monster Squad, Pumpkinhead, Goro in Mortal Kombat, and that's just to name a few. And of course, he was the lead alien in the rest of the franchise. It goes without saying, we're back to one alien again. Which I'm all for if it works. There's no weapons on this planet, so they don't have any resources to fight the alien. It's a good attempt at making it a scary movie again about one monster, but it fails at generating any suspense. When the alien claims its first victim, it's extremely predictable. We've never seen this guy before, so we know he's gonna die. Unlike the first movie, which took old cliches and improved them, Alien 3 takes these cliches and just makes them seem older than ever. It makes constant use of POV shots whenever the alien is chasing people. It looks pretty cool, but it's not scary. Putting us in the alien's perspective is more fun than threatening. I have to mention, there's some kind of religious themes going on here, something about Ripley being the messiah, but I don't know exactly what the movie's trying to get at. For me, the best part is the ending, so you might call this a spoiler alert. At the end of the movie, the alien is destroyed, but it's not over. We learn here that Ripley has an alien inside her. That's right, another one got aboard the ship. After they blew the queen alien out the airlock, couldn't they do a thorough check and see if there's anything left? Or was it the same face hugger that laid two eggs? Usually it impregnates one person and then it falls off and dies, so who knows. The Wayland Company arrive, with Lance Hendrickson playing a man who looks identical to Bishop. That's because he was the guy who designed the android in his own image. They tell Ripley that they will surgically remove the alien from her and destroy it, but she doesn't trust them. So, she sacrifices her own life for the good of the universe, holding the alien like her own infant. It's an epic scene that almost redeems the movie for me. I like that they had the balls to kill off its main character and firmly declare this is it, the last Alien movie. It's strange that only a year before this, James Cameron ended the Terminator franchise in the same way. At the end of Terminator 2, all traces of the Terminators are destroyed so that the company can't research and develop any more of them. Our main character, the last Terminator, sacrifices himself in a pool of molten steel. Alien 3 used almost the same exact ending, and with both franchises, we thought it would be the last, but both times, we were wrong. Alien 3 is not a terrible movie, it's just... okay. I wish I could say it's underrated. Every time I rewatch it, I always hope it'll grow on me, and that I'll discover some artistic merit that I overlooked, but every time, I'm always just as disappointed. They should have stopped at number 2. It's Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Alien 3 was meant to be the final film of the franchise, but with any movie that doesn't satisfy its fans, give it five years and out comes Alien Resurrection, literally trying to resurrect the franchise. With a cliche, shitty title like that, the movie gives you exactly what it advertises. It throws away the serious tone of Alien 3 and goes for simple entertainment, for better or for worse. I saw it in the theater on its opening day. I remember enjoying it. 
but since then haven't felt any desire to watch it again until I had to to do this review. It's that kind of movie. Its purpose is to rack in some cash while entertaining moviegoers for a few weekends and then it fades from memory. It was written by Joss Whedon, who's probably better known today for The Avengers, but he also wrote Waterworld, another product of the 90s that was a big deal when it came out, but since fell beneath the waves. His plot for Alien Resurrection actually had a lot of potential. It takes place 200 years after the events of Alien 3. Ripley gets cloned by scientists so they can extract the alien from her body. I'm not sure how cloning her would also clone the alien inside her, or where they've been keeping her DNA for the past 200 years, but hey, it works. It's nice to see Sigourney Weaver back in the role one last time. Of course, this is not the same Ripley, this is a clone, and somehow the alien DNA mixed with hers. It's the fly effect. She becomes a hybrid between alien and human. I hear them, they're so close. This was an interesting concept, but it doesn't really pay off. It just increases her basketball skills. Anyway, the baby alien becomes a queen with the ability to lay eggs. Out from the eggs come the face huggers. And you know, in order for them to populate, they need to have a human host. So hey, that sounds like a good idea. Let's breed some killer aliens. So the scientists get these human bodies from a group of mercenary body collectors. As soon as the aliens escape their holding cells, Ripley and the mercenaries have to fight for survival aboard the ship. It tries to go back to the series' roots, mainly aliens with its action survival elements. Each movie had its own tone and its own genre that it was trying to be. Alien was like a haunted house movie, Aliens was like a war movie, Alien 3 was like a prison drama, and Alien Resurrection is like a slapstick comedy. I mean, it's downright silly. Other things that characterize the film is its regular use of wide-angle lenses and quick pans. All the action scenes are very well shot and edited. I think this is the movie's greatest strength. Sometimes it goes a little overboard, as if they're trying to make a music video or something. Winona Ryder plays an android. It's supposed to come as a surprise, but yeah, she's an android. Whatever. Moving on. Brad Dourif plays the main scientist. He goes completely over the top, especially when he's trapped in the alien cocoon. He uses his manic Chucky voice. That is Ripley's gift to her. A human reproductive system. She is giving birth for you, Ripley, and now she is perfect! Like I said, there are some interesting ideas here. Like a room full of failed Ripley clones. <coughs> this is the only scene in the movie that's effectively disturbing. Not only does Ripley have the DNA of the alien, but also the aliens have her DNA as well, so they slowly evolve to become more human-like. The queen alien develops a womb and gives birth to a human alien, which kills its mother in favor of Ripley. This thing, I have to say, is awesome. Beautiful little baby. Tom Woodruff and company outdid themselves. I especially like how the creature dies. It gets sucked through a tiny hole in the ship. It's cartoonish but it fits with the mood of the rest of the film. Watch, here comes the skull. And there it goes! This movie may not be a masterpiece, but it's more entertaining than Alien 3. Alien 3 went for an artistic vision, but failed. Alien Resurrection went for entertaining trash and succeeded. It's the golden turd of the franchise. It doesn't take itself seriously and doesn't try to be anything more than what it is. It 
Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Alien vs. Predator. Alright, well, first of all, Predator. 1987, Arnold Schwarzenegger. You son of a bitch. A bunch of army men are being killed by this extraterrestrial hunter who kills humans for sport. Like Alien, it blends horror and science fiction. It's a slasher film set in the jungle, and the killer even wears a mask. That's right, they keep its face a secret until the last scene. You're one ugly motherfucker. This creature is a spectacular design. It wears armor, has infrared vision, and can turn invisible. There's nothing special about the plot, but it has the same kind of action that made aliens so great and memorable characters to boot. This stuff will make you a goddamn sexual tyrannosaurus, just like me. It also has the same level of suspense that made the original alien a classic. The final battle between Arnold and the Predator is a nail-biting cat and mouse game. Rather than blunt force, it's all about survival tactics and trying to outsmart each other. Come on, kill me, I'm here! So that's Predator. If you haven't seen it, then see it. The Predator alien seemed like the perfect foe for the Xenomorph alien, and it didn't take long for anyone to realize this. As early as 1990, the first Alien vs. Predator story appeared in the Dark Horse Presents series. All throughout the 90s, there were tons of Alien vs. Predator stuff. Comics, novels, and video games. In Predator 2, released in 1990, we see the Predator skull trophies on display, and one of them is a xenomorph alien skull. It was a setup for a crossover, much like the ending from Jason Goes to Hell when Freddy's glove comes up and grabs Jason's mask. But for both crossovers, we had to wait until the 2000s. Versus movies like these just don't happen often. The only worthwhile examples could be counted on one hand. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, King Kong vs. Godzilla, Freddy vs. Jason, uh, unless you want to count all the numerous Godzilla vs. and Gamera vs. movies, but that's what those entire series are all about. Oh, and we're not counting Kramer vs. Kramer. Good movie, though. No monsters in it. Um, by the time Alien vs. Predator came out in 2004, it built up so much hype that it couldn't live up to its own epicness. When this movie came out in theaters, I didn't hear one good thing about it. Everyone said it was terrible, so I didn't even bother. Even when it came out on DVD, I was too preoccupied with other things, so this movie escaped me for a long time. I watched it for the first time recently, so my expectations were very low, and I wasn't as disappointed as everyone else was. It's not terrible. To me, the perfect adjective is underwhelming. It's not as bad as everyone says. It's just not great. A group of archaeologists investigate an ancient pyramid on an island near Antarctica. They're led by Charles Bishop Wayland, the founder of the Wayland Company that's in the first three Alien movies. This one takes place in the present time, so we can assume he's the ancestor of Michael Wayland from Alien 3, who designed the android Bishop. Why the two would bear such a strong resemblance over hundreds of years makes no sense. But hey, who cares? It's just an excuse to have Lance Hendrickson in it. With no Sigourney Weaver, it's nice to have at least one person from the established franchise. And if you really want to get yourself confused, what about Peter Wayland from Prometheus? That would have taken place in between. But trying to connect all these movies is a senseless mission that'll have you banging your head against the wall. Anyway, they find this pyramid and soon realize it's the breeding grounds for xenomorphs. You see, in ancient times, the predators would visit Earth and the early human civilizations worshipped them as gods. They sacrificed themselves to the predators who would use their bodies as hosts for the xenomorphs. Why did the predators want to breed the xenomorphs? Because they're the ultimate prey. I guess they just needed a challenge. But the predators are sore losers. Whenever they're defeated, they self-destruct, blowing everything up. Now, after all these years, they've been in hibernation or whatever, and the team find themselves in the middle of the battle. At least this movie delivers what it promises. The alien fights the predator. That's what we've come to see, that's what we get. The suits and the stunt work are all pretty good. There's some CG in the movie, but most of it is the real deal. 
There's even a confrontation with the Queen Alien that reminds us of the ending of Aliens. At least that's what it seems they were trying to get at, but it's nowhere near as awesome. There's nothing specific in this movie that sticks out to me as bad, it just has an overall aura of cheapness. It has some great action highlights, but no memorable characters, and nothing else really worth talking about. It's Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. If you thought the first Alien vs. Predator was bad, check this out. Aliens vs. Predator Requiem. Yep, they tried it again, and again they failed. It picks up where Alien vs. Predator left off, where an alien bursts out of the Predator, becoming an Alien-Predator hybrid. I have to admit, I'm impressed they went through with that idea, Usually, it would just be a bullshit cliffhanger, a gag before the end credits, but here, they actually follow up on it. The Predator's ship crashes in a populated area. The facehuggers break out and breed aliens all across town. Then, more Predators come down to Earth to take care of business. I do have to mention, these Alien vs. Predator movies take some liberties with the continuity of the rest of the series, so they're not really part of the same storyline. Still, I have to include them in Sequel-a-thon. What sets this apart from all the other Alien films is that it takes place in a civilized area. The other movies put its characters in isolated places. Whether on board a futuristic spaceship or on a prison planet, they all had their own distinct setting. This one uses present-day, real life. I think eventually the series had to go in this direction, after it exhausted every other possibility. I can understand why they wanted to set this one in a common world that we recognize as our own. This gave it some potential to see what kind of damage these species could do in a residential area. But it doesn't live up to its potential as much as it opens the door for typical horror cliches. The characters are your average, generic, uninspired, teen horror shitheads. I hate every one of them. The creature effects are the only reason to see the movie, but they're shot in a dark and incoherent way so you can barely tell what's going on. The whole movie has a murky look which adds to its stale atmosphere of crappiness. One thing this movie did was up the gore. That was something that apparently everyone complained about with the first Alien vs. Predator. In the US, anytime a movie gets a PG-13 rating instead of an R, people flip their shit. So with this one, they gave it an R and satisfied everyone's demands. It even says it on the back of the DVD. Honestly, comparing the two movies, I didn't notice the gore that much. The only thing I did notice was how the series went on such a downward slope. It began with two cinematic masterpieces and then de-evolved into I Know What You Shit Last Summer. Two franchises that started on the top of the slasher genre had now stooped beneath it. Alien was released in 1979, but was made for all time. This movie was released in 2007, made for 2007, and that was it. Maybe we'll see Alien vs. Predator Reloaded next. Hopefully we'll see some better crossovers in the near future. You know what would be awesome? If there was no humans in the movie. Yeah, no discernible dialogue, just aliens and predators in space killing each other for an hour and a half. Instead of focusing on a bunch of douchebags caught in the crossfire. With all seriousness, even though these two films were flops, it's nice to see these kind of versus movies come into existence at all. So, that's it for the Alien franchise. Tomorrow, we resurrect the dead. Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Cinema Massacre. To 
close out this year's Monster Madness, I'd say I left the best for last. We've had mummies, Frankenstein, giant monsters, aliens. It's only fitting that we end with zombies. And there's no zombie series more important than director George Romero's Dead series. You know the gist. It's set in a dystopian, end-of-the-world type environment. The dead rise to eat the flesh, the living. They can only be killed by having their brains destroyed with a bullet or other object. The living people struggle for survival and fight amongst themselves. That's the formula that all zombie movies follow. Followed since. Of course, in the past decade, there's been so many zombie movies, it's mind-numbing. Recently, The Walking Dead show brought it to the mainstream with television audiences. Zombies have probably never been more popular than they are now, but they still seem to take their inspiration from the George Romero films. We all know the first one, but if you didn't, it was Night of the Living Dead in 1968, the only black and white film of the franchise. I talked about it during the first year's Monster Madness, and in my top 30 favorite films list, and in my trip to the Night Living Dead Cemetery video, so I think I've already said enough about it. But you know what? This is Sequel-a-thon, so I can't skip over the movie that single-handedly changed the face of the whole horror movie industry, so I'm going to save it for Halloween. It may be a little unconventional that we're going out of order, but I have something special planned for it. Anyway, Dawn of the Dead I also mentioned the first year, but let's dig deeper. It was released in 1978, 10 years after the original. With no survivors from the previous film, at least not from the main cast, this one started fresh and new. One thing that has to be said about the Dead series is that even though they're considered to be sequels, they typically don't have any recurring characters. But each movie seems to have a progression that the zombie apocalypse is growing and the human population is becoming less and less. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. As the movie begins, all-out madness is going on. A TV news station is swamped with stories of the zombie epidemic. Also, a SWAT team is busting in on a building only to be attacked by the living dead. It's brutal. Flesh is bitten off and a head is blown to pieces. The movie gives you no time to brace yourself. It drops you straight into the pandemonium. Two SWAT members escape into a helicopter along with two news reporters. They need fuel so they land at a gas station where more zombie attacks happen. Another creative gory highlight happens when the blades of the helicopter chop off the top of a zombie's head. Another thing that happens here is a group of child zombies have to be gunned down. This is one of the most disturbing scenes. Actor Ken Forey has said that this was a very difficult scene to shoot because it was so horrible, but that's the thing about these movies is that it's very grim and unapologetic. If this were to happen in real life, if there really was a zombie epidemic, same thing would happen to children too. Also in this scene, we're shown how useless the female character is. What is she doing? She's not helping at all. She's just standing there. The women in these movies are always flat, badly ridden characters. The SWAT team scene and the gas station scene are just warm-ups to the main event. And that's the shopping mall. Hiding in a mall seems like the prime choice of a place to hide out if there's a zombie apocalypse. They have plenty of resources in there. Food, clothes, anything they need. Even a gun shop. People often complain about characters in horror movies doing things that are stupid, but these characters are smart and that makes us respect them. As the movie goes on, we come to know them like old friends and we root for their survival. It isn't that easy. First they need to lure many of the zombies out of the mall and lock them out. There's a lot of strategy involved and it takes a lot of the film's running time. Something that would seem tedious, but it's done so convincingly that it never comes off as boring. We got this, man. We got this by the ass. You can imagine yourself in this situation and thinking about what you would do. It's also fun to imagine what it would be like to have an entire shopping mall to yourself. The characters do manage to get some much deserved downtime. They just go all around the mall and do whatever they want. While most of the film is dark and serious in tone, this part offers some comedic relief. Wait, think. <laughs> Relief is the key word here. We breathe a sigh and laugh along with these characters as if we are in the mall with them. 
You get a genuinely triumphant feeling when you see them celebrating with one another. Earlier on, they were arguing and pointing guns at each other, and now, after all their teamwork and strategy, they've become buddies. You did all right this time, fly boy. How about it? In Night of the Living Dead, the survivors try to work together, but end up fighting. Dawn of the Dead is the dawn, the light at the end of the tunnel. It's a more optimistic look at people. Through hard work and teamwork, we can all settle our differences. The mall setting gives a great opportunity for lots of comedy, but it's also noted that it's social satire as well, comparing mall shoppers to zombies. I can't imagine what it was like filming inside the mall, and yes, it was a real shopping mall. On the documentary on the DVD, they say that they'd film each night when the mall was closed. And I find that really hard to imagine how could they clean up everything by the morning. Like somewhere there must have been a blood stain or some guts laying around for a mall shopper to find. The mall is located in Monroeville, Pennsylvania. We at Cinemassacre took a trip there one time, and it's barely recognizable from the film. Unless you have some screen grabs to take with you, it's not easy to remember anything from the film. The giant clock is gone, and there's no indication that this innocent mall was at one time the scene of one of the biggest bloodbaths in horror history. The master of gore, Tom Savini, does the special effects, but also plays one of the film's most memorable characters, the machete-wielding leader of a motorcycle gang. Once again, the movie handles the situation realistically. If there was a perfect place to hide out in a zombie epidemic, our main protagonists would not be the only people who want to hide there. This hard-partying, rebellious motorcycle gang doesn't want to share. They want to bust in and take the place for their own. The final act of the film is just all-out chaos. Tops the original with gore. Heads are cut off, intestines are ripped out. Man, it's crazy. The music is also very memorable. It's done by a band called Goblin. One of my favorite parts is when one of the motorcycle guys checks his blood pressure on one of those mall things. Oh, man, what the hell are you doing playing around? Someone's up there shooting. He's so casual. He should be yelling, up there! But no, instead, what the hell are you doing playing around when someone's up there shooting at us? There's lots of parts where the humor grows on me. The guy with the mustache cracks me up. Wow. You must get in through the roof. Son of a bitch. Son of a bitch. They got trucks blocking all the entrances. Look at that. Yeah, trucks. Yeah, trucks. Also, love when Flyboy becomes a zombie. This is probably my favorite zombie of all time. I like all the little details, like the gun dangling from his hand. The character was holding the gun before he died, so the zombie isn't intentionally holding the gun. The gun just happens to be there. And that walk he does, it looks like he really is mangled up. Overall, Dawn of the Dead is simply a masterpiece sequel. It's one of those rare Bride of Frankenstein or Aliens type situations where the sequel is debatably better than the first one. Following in the footsteps of a groundbreaking horror masterpiece, this one manages to be groundbreaking all over again in its own right. There's different cuts to this movie. There's the US version, the European version, and the extended version, which runs a little bit too long. Between the US and European versions, they both have their advantages. It's hard to pick one. Dario Argento handled the European version and had his disagreements with George Romero. I think if I had to choose one, I'd pick the US version just because it has some great moments that were missing from the European version. Either way, you're in for a great film. I can't do it justice, so don't listen to me. Just watch it for yourself. It's Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Day of the Dead was the Black Sheep sequel of the franchise. It had two masterpieces to compare with, and it came out in 1985, the same year as Return of the Living Dead, Fright Night, and Reanimator. So it had a lot to live up to. George Romero's original script was so large and epic that Tom Savini described it as the Ben-Hur of zombie movies. Unfortunately, there were budget cuts, and the finished film wasn't as huge a scale as Romero intended. 
when it came out, fans and critics hated it. But over the years since, it's been reevaluated, and people are starting to realize it overcame the number three curse. It's another masterpiece like the first two. So how did its excellence go unnoticed for so long? Same happened with me. The first time I saw it, I didn't like it. I thought that it paled in comparison to the first two movies. It didn't have a memorable soundtrack. It didn't have a fun mall setting. Not as many funny one-liners. But over the years, after re-watching it, it's grown on me like a fungus. The opening scene shows a city overrun by zombies, with no human life anywhere in sight. It's one of the most creepy, dystopian scenes in the series. It tells you everything you need to know without any dialogue. These images say it all. This is our glimpse of the surface. The rest of the movie, we go below ground level, where the only survivors are in the hands of a military operation run by the ruthless Captain Rhodes, played by Joe Palato. A large part of why this movie is so awesome is because of his performance. This guy is one mean son of a bitch. If someone doesn't follow his orders, he has no hesitation to threaten them with deadly force. I just told you I was willing to kill you if you didn't get back in your chair. You didn't get back in your chair. Any scene he's in is full of nervous tension. Shoot that woman or you're dead. You think I'm fucking around, Steve? He also has no compassion for the scientists who are working themselves to exhaustion. Is there food? I'm running this monkey farm now, Frankenstein, and I want to know what the fuck you're doing with my time! He's easily one of the best villains of the 80s, the guy you love to hate. Then there's the head scientist who's always referred to as Frankenstein. He's a very convincing character, unshaven, glazy eyes, looks like he hasn't slept in ages. He's supposed to be finding the solution to stop the dead from rising, but instead he starts teaching them to be civilized. The zombie, named Bub, shows signs of humanity and comes off as innocent and sympathetic. He is the Frankenstein monster of the film. The people in the film are the ones who are less civilized. The first two dead movies brushed upon this theme, but now we're going under the surface, and while we are quite literally going underground, we are getting at the core of what these movies are really about, the dehumanization of people and the rise of the dead. I think if it were to go full circle, we might have Planet of the Zombies, kind of like Planet of the Apes, where apes are the intelligent life form and people are the animals. Come on, you dick faces. Here's a nice one, Agon. Oh. still whip it out. The two main soldiers are like Rhodes' two bumbling sidekicks, spending most of the time insulting the zombies like they even care. You dumb fucking bags of shit, I'll kick your fucking asses, come on! It's a comedy show. Shoot that woman. Bang! You're dead! <laughs> Well, having funny villains is one thing, but how about protagonists who we root for? Most of the characters are pretty generic, but the one who stands out is Sarah. She's the first woman in a George Romero zombie movie to not be a throwaway character. She takes a lot of shit from the guys, and that makes us root for her. You're incapable of exciting me, Steele, except as an anthropological curiosity. Oh, what the hell does that mean, Rick? She dares to talk back to Rhodes and tries to be the mediator between everything that's going on. She's tough, not at all a wimp, and if there is a protagonist in the film, it's her. The score is also great, even though it's not catchy like in Dawn of the Dead, it's played at minimum just to accentuate all the tense moments. A lot of the film's running time is long dialogue scenes, but at least the dialogue is riveting. How are we going to set an example for them if we behave barbarically ourselves? It also dishes out a heavy serving of action and gore. Flesh is chewed, eyeballs get ripped out, fingers get bitten off, and one of my favorites is the shovel kill. When I first saw the movie and didn't like it, I was still impressed by the gore. This has to be Tom Savini's crowning achievement. It's a true testament to the power of practical special effects. 
It's absolutely brutal. People commit suicide, sacrifice themselves to the zombies, and earlier, when this guy gets bitten on the arm, his friends try to save his life by amputating the arm. Never had that been done before. Usually in these movies, once you get bitten, you're a goner. The people in this movie don't just die, they fucking suffer. Here we have a guy who gets torn apart, and notice that when his vocal cords get ripped out, his voice screeches. It's like you yanked out the tape from an audio cassette player. But the ultimate death, and I mean the most horrible death that ever happens to anyone, is the guy who deserves it, when Rhodes is ripped into shreds. They used real cow guts from a butcher shop, and they kept them in a fridge, but something happened, they lost power, or for some reason the guts got spoiled, so you can imagine what the smell was like. So just as the character is going through hell, so is the actor. So proud of Day of the Dead, with its apocalyptic setting and power struggles going on, it very much feels like some of the same themes from the earlier films are being repeated. But this movie took it a step further. It's darker than the other movies, and being underground the whole time, it feels a lot more claustrophobic. We're stuck with a bunch of nutty characters, and it feels like we're in the madhouse with them. She got herself an honest to God dick to get off on, huh? <laughs> it may be yellow, but it's still a dick! <laughs> but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It would have been the perfect way to end the trilogy. It's probably the best horror trilogy since the Karloff trilogy of Frankenstein films. I know I equate this to Frankenstein all the time, but it's true. As far as quality goes, the third Dead movie is the equivalent of the third Frankenstein film. It's the one that at first seems inferior, but as time goes on, it grows on you. All three of them have their own advantages, so it's hard to pick a favorite, and each one represents the decade in which it was made. Night of the Living Dead was the 60s, Dawn of the Dead was the 70s, Day of the Dead was the 80s. I think 1985 was the peak year in zombie films. You had Return of the Living Dead and Reanimator and all that. I think after that year, zombie movies were done. Like, that's it. You can't beat it. Cinema Massacre's Monster Madness. Day of the Dead seemed like the definitive end to the Dead series. It tied it all up in a nice, beautiful bow of blood-soaked intestines. Night Living Dead was remade in 1990 with Tom Savini in the director's chair. Once they start remaking the franchise, you know that they're never going to go back and do more sequels. And by the 2000s, zombie movies were in full bloom again. There were more zombie movies in the 2000s than there were in every other decade total. Including a remake of both Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead. Rumors of a fourth Dead film were floating around for a long time, but then... It finally happened. The master himself, George Romero, made a much welcome return to the genre that he created. The long-awaited follow-up was released in 2005, a full 20 years since the last film of the franchise. Since we went from night to dawn to day, everyone assumed this would be Dusk of the Dead or Twilight of the Dead, but we were all wrong. It was Land of the Dead. All the other zombie movies of the time stopped and bowed down to the true king, this wasn't just another zombie movie. This was the real thing. It was George Romero. All the other movies seemed like appetizers for the main course. But in the grand scheme of things, Land of the Dead unfortunately seemed to blend in with the rest. In comparison to all the other zombie films that were going on, it comes off as somewhat generic. It's still my favorite zombie film of the decade, but I can see why it was overlooked. I blame it on an oversaturation of the genre. Just as all these movies were paying tribute to the George Romero films, George Romero was still paying little tributes to the classic Universal films. It opens with the old Universal logo from the 30s. In Day of the Dead, our last survivors were living underground, but land brings us back to the surface in a much less claustrophobic landscape. 
where we can see all the areas where life still goes on in this zombie apocalypse. Now we're at a point where zombies are so commonplace that people are more used to them. The living have integrated the dead into their lives and use them for fun and games. By the way, that's Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright. George Romero was a big fan of Shaun of the Dead, so he invited them over to be in the film. Here we have what I'd call a modern medieval setting where there's a very distinct barrier between the rich and the poor. In the center of it all is a place called Fiddler's Green. This would be the castle where the king in charge is none other than Dennis Hopper. That's right, Dennis over the top fucking Hopper. Let's go. Come on, let's go. Seeing him as the villain made it feel like the 90s again. Come back here, you son of a bitch, you got the fucking keys! Fiddler's Green is a place of luxury where all the people enjoy themselves and give no thought to the horror that's going on outside. It's very much like the Edgar Allan Poe story, Mask of the Red Death, where the plague is killing everybody on the outside while the prince throws a party inside his safe fortress for all his elite crowd. On the outside, you have the slums, where people are living dirt poor. Somewhere in between, you have John Leguizamo, who plays an assassin named Cholo, who works for Dennis Hopper's character, Kaufman. After working for his boss for so long and trying to schmooze him over with some cheap sparkling wine that he robbed from a liquor store, Cholo asks him for his own place in the green. But Kaufman denies him, and that really pisses off Cholo. You're gonna let me in, because I know what goes on around here. Hmm, John Leguizamo and Dennis Hopper. I'm having some kind of deja vu moment here. You know what I'm thinking of. The Super Mario Brothers movie. You know what I'm talking about! Luigi and Koopa. It's a Super Mario Brothers reunion. Anyway, Luigi, I mean Cholo, gets his hands on a giant killing weapon called Dead Reckoning. Strangely, that was the working title of the film. It's like a giant train that shoots missiles. At first, I hated this thing and thought it made the movie feel too much like a comic book. But now, I don't mind it. It's pretty badass. Cholo threatens Kaufman with this thing, demanding a shitload of money, or else he's gonna aim his missiles at Fiddler's Green. Five million dollars. I'm gonna blow you out of your fucking castle. He said castle. You mean like Bowser's castle? Anyway, here's a part I didn't know where to fit in the review, just a funny one-liner from a random character. What happened, Riley? Did you get fucked? You got fucked! <laughs> On the outskirts of the city are a group of zombies led by one known as Big Daddy, who's growing in intelligence, and decides to lead them all to Fiddler's Green. Throughout the film, they keep getting closer. We follow their progress as if they're on a great adventure. With Cholo ready to fire missiles at the city and the zombies closing in, the movie reaches its climax and all hell breaks loose. The zombies break in the Fiddler's Green, which by the way is the worst glass break ever. I think the most disappointing part of the film is the gore. Each of the dead movies upped the ante on the gore, so I felt this one should have done the same. And yes, it is very gory, but I think because it's the fourth movie, the kills should have been more creative and over the top. That's just my preference. Even with the uncut version, I didn't notice any difference. I'm sure there's extra frames here and there that the shots go on a little bit longer, but it's nothing noticeable. It's just as disappointing as the uncut version of Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Also, a lot of the blood is computer generated. It looks like a Resident Evil video game. I miss the bright red hyper-realistic blood from Dawn of the Dead. There are some great highlights, but they're brief. My favorite is the grenade kill. This time, the effects are not done by Tom Savini, but instead Greg Nicoretto, who worked under Tom Savini on Day of the Dead, so it's the perfect transition. And in between that time, he worked on a lot of horror films, like Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, and From Dusk Till Dawn. Tom Savini does a cameo. Ever since I saw it, I wondered, is this the same character he played in Dawn of the Dead, now as a zombie? 
I'm carrying a machete. Yeah. You know, I mean, what are we gonna do? Stuff it down your throat? You know, I mean, right there. That's look, awesome, imagine man. that as a zombie, and you got Land of the Dead. So basically, duh, it is. It's the first recurring character in a Romero zombie movie. This is much darker than the earlier films, and I mean that literally. It's dark and atmospheric with many excellent shots. Many of them are green screened with lots of separate elements and layers completing the picture, but it's done so well you don't notice. It looks awesome. The image of the zombies coming out of the water is unforgettable, obviously inspired by Carnival of Souls. So I've mentioned its strengths and its weaknesses. Overall, Land of the Dead doesn't match its predecessors, but it's still pretty damn good. It's Cinna Massacre's Monster Madness. I have to say, I was one of those who was eagerly awaiting Land of the Dead. It was the first George Romero zombie movie in 20 years. I was satisfied with it, I got my fix. But then, only two years later, he came out with another one, Diary of the Dead. I did not expect this. But hey, another one from the master? I'll take it. George Romero's always been one of my idols, but there comes a time when you realize not everything your idol does is gold. Diary of the Dead, once again, has no direct connection with any of the other Dead films, but this one seems to step back in time when the zombie epidemic is in its early phase. We aren't so deep yet into the zombie apocalypse, people are just becoming aware of what's happening. But the original movie took place in the 60s, this one is set in the present day YouTube generation, so I guess you could say this one's a reboot. The style that sets it apart from the other Dead movies is that it's one of those found footage films like Blair Witch Project and Cloverfield. It centers around a low-budget filmmaker, Jason, who's trying to make a horror movie, but then the real-life zombies start attacking. So instead he begins filming the zombie crisis every step of the way with the help of his girlfriend, Deborah. After Jason is killed, she edits all the footage together and releases it as a documentary called The Death of Death. I like the idea of this found footage style, but here it's done completely wrong. The whole idea of that style is to make it seem convincing that what you're watching is real. The quality of the footage is way too good for us to believe it was spontaneously shot. Everybody is always in focus and always well lit. I mean, the lighting is dark, but not in an unintentional way, in a staged, moody, and cinematic way, just like any real horror film. Even more baffling is the composition. Everything that happens, they manage to capture it. Not once does the camera ever miss anything. Shoot in the head! Even when they put the camera down, everybody is always inside the frame. Every shot looks planned. They also use two cameras so they can cut between two angles. It's as if Romero couldn't decide to make a found footage movie or a regular cinematic film. Not to mention, these people are holding the cameras like robots. They don't even look like they care what's going on. Why are they not running? Also, the idea of cutting between multiple cameras ruins the subjective nature of a POV. There's no long takes to make us feel like we're really there. Not to mention one tiny detail, the two cameras are completely different. One of them is some kind of pro camera, the other is clearly a DVX-100, which isn't even a high-def camera. Deborah calls it an HVX, but it's not. This is a more nitpicky thing. The point is, these two cameras would never match so flawlessly. The audio is the most inexcusable of all. Everybody's voice is 100% clear. Come on, before we get our asses shot off. Tracy! I'm leaving you, Jason. You can keep the house, I'll take the car. Did they ADR this whole documentary, or did everybody have hidden microphones? Come on. Then there's the music. Why would there be music? Oh, don't worry, Deborah explains it. I've added music occasionally for effect, hoping to scare you. You see, in addition to trying to tell you the truth, I am hoping to scare you. 
This line is embarrassing. Like, really? You're going to spell it out like that? This is a horror movie. Get ready to be scared. And if you have footage of your friends being killed, how could you be so insensitive to put music in it? Then there's the don't mess with Texas girl. Don't mess with Texas. Don't mess with Texas. How do you like that music? I guess Deborah added that in because she felt it needed a little comedy relief. A minor thing, when one of the cameras is losing battery power, we see the battery icon on the screen. That wouldn't happen unless Deborah added it there to be cute. Most importantly, there's the acting. In these found footage films, that's the hardest part to get right. If the acting is not believable, then everything falls apart. And here, all the acting all across the board is awful. Well, who is screaming? Me. You want me to show you how? For the camera? For history? <laughs> That's enough, Deb. I got it. There is not one line of dialogue spoken that doesn't sound fake. Take, for example, this scene where Jason is filming in a girl's dorm and encounters a robber. The fuck are you doing here? What the fuck are you doing here? I'm just stealing shit. But you, what's the guy with the video camera doing in the women's dorm, huh? Security! <laughs> Did the robber forget he's on video? One thing that'll satisfy any zombie fan is the abundance of gore. It's all computer generated, but it still does the trick. One scene that sticks out is when they meet a deaf Amish guy who communicates by writing on a chalkboard. It's an abrupt change of mood. It's a comedy scene played for laughs. Christ. Be honest, we're friendly folk. I wonder why Deborah didn't add some goofy music. And I'm not here to rip the movie apart. I don't want to talk about every little moment that bugged me, but I can't let this go. They're sitting around listening to a news broadcast, and right when it ends, they turn off the TV. From his ranch, and he's asked the American people to remain vigilant. I hate that. I hate that cliche. I understand why they do it. They have the TV running here, and they don't want the sound of the TV running over the rest of the scene, so they shut it off just for convenience. But it's one thing to do it in a real cinematic movie, but to do it in a found footage film, that's just dumb. Romero always has an agenda. Every movie he makes has some kind of message. One thing he seems to be getting at here is how people are becoming desensitized to the tragedies of the world. I can see how some people vicariously watch the tragedies on the news safe from their living rooms, but I don't understand how this applies to the filmmakers who are actually there in danger themselves. It's strange how looking at things, seeing things through a lens, a, a glass, rose-colored or shaded black, you become immune. Another thing the movie seems to be trying to say is that the news on TV hides the truth. They changed it. They recut it. The media were lying to us, or the government was lying to them. I would assume the message here is that the common people who record things and upload them to the internet are a more truthful source of information. But then the movie goes on to say that there's an oversaturation of information because everybody with a camera is uploading stuff. The more voices there are, the more spin there is. The truth becomes that much harder to find. In the end, it's all just noise. Scattered over the entire film is Deborah's annoying narration beating these messages into your head. What gets into our heads when we see something horrible? So what is the message? What is the movie really trying to say? It's the first Romero film where the politics and the messages get in the way of it being an entertaining movie. I respect that Romero went back to his indie roots. Diary of the Dead was much lower budget than Land of the Dead, and Romero said that he had a lot more control over it. I'm glad that he's still making movies in the 21st century, but this is one that I tend to forget about. It tried to do something different in an age that's oversaturated with zombie films, but it was misguided and didn't hit the right notes for me. It 
Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Of all the dead films, Survival of the Dead is the hardest for me to review because I never expected this movie to exist. George Romero used to make these movies once every 10 years, and now, in his old age, he cranked out three of them in rapid succession. Of all the dead films, this is the one that best fits the description of a sequel. It seems to follow the events of Diary of the Dead, and it has a main recurring character. The two things that I didn't like about Diary of the Dead are fixed this time. One is the found footage style, which I thought had potential but was misguided. This time we're back to a regular narrative style. And the other thing is the in-your-face social commentary. This time it's downplayed under the surface, like it should be. It centers around people from the military who are trying to escape the zombie crisis by boat and arrive at an island where people are in disagreement over how to handle the zombies. On one side, there's people who want to kill them all. On the other side, you have people who want to keep the zombies around, keeping them chained up or behind fences, in hopes that one day a cure will be discovered. I think that's an interesting idea, but it doesn't come to any interesting resolution, and it seems sort of like a recycling of some of the ideas in Day of the Dead and other zombie films, but you, you really can't blame it because there's been so many zombie movies that pretty much everything's been done already. Now for some casual observations. There's a lot of wide open scenery. It's a pleasant film to look at and makes me think of autumn weather. There's also a lot of western movie elements here. There's a lot of dark humor as well. It's kind of similar in tone to Shaun of the Dead, which Romero was a big fan of. Well, there's nothing in here as brilliant as Shaun of the Dead, but it's still pretty amusing. There's some great zombie kills. It's heavy on CG, but there is one moment that uses practical effects where the zombies are ripping people apart. It's nothing original, but it's nice to see a little bit of that classic Romero gore. There's zombie heads on spikes, which is a pretty sick idea. This is the creepiest and most noteworthy image in the film. Setting fire to a zombie's head has to be the most awkward effect. It just looks weird. Overall, Survival of the Dead? It's okay. I don't have any peeves with it like I did with Diary of the Dead, and nothing really sticks out as being groundbreaking either. It's just okay. I think the big problem was that there were so many zombie movies that I was completely numb to the genre. This one just blends in with the rest. If it hadn't been for the name George Romero, I wouldn't have been watching it. But let's not end the Halloween season on such a dull note. Tomorrow, we're going to look at the masterpiece that started it all, Night of the Living Dead. This is one of those instances where I say, the movie's so good, I can't do it justice. Just watch it. And that's what we're going to do. So, tune in tomorrow for Halloween. It's going to be Night of the Living Dead, full-length commentary. 